He's also the founder and incorporator of professional Professors Without Borders, a nonprofit organization that aims to provide quality education to underprivileged communities around the world. He's the chair of the upcoming fourth international conference on TBM in difficult ground. And, and indirectly, he was also involved in, the, in uh, mitigating the recent tunnel disaster in Silkaira as well. So, Professor Jamal, the stage is all, all yours now. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you so much for your kind introduction. Um, I'd like to thank the organizer of the conference for inviting me. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you in person due to my um, you know, travel schedule. I was in India actually last week and cut back last Sunday, so I couldn't stay on because of the last two uh, weeks of the semester, I had to come back and uh, finish my courses. Uh, the uh, topic I'm going to present to you today is uh, about TBMs and TBM tunneling, and essentially some of the lessons learned in recent projects and uh, you know uh, issues that had to go to claims and um, uh, of course disputes. And what can we do to address some of the gaps in geotech investigations that could at least prevent uh, or reduce the amount of disputes and uh, you know claims and make the project a little bit more successful. So the outline of my presentation is to give you an uh, you know introduction. Uh, we'll discuss what's the difference between the uh, you know tunnel and other applications in terms of geotech. Uh, talk to you about TBM and TBM classification, some of the case histories, uh, gap in the geotech investigation, what we can do with it, and of course go to a uh, uh, summary of Q&A. So why are we talking about this topic? Uh, the reality is that at uh, this stage, TBM tunneling is dominating uh, in terms of method of tunneling. I mean, hands on, if you want to think about how we do tunneling these days, um, the number one choice is typically a TBM. Of course, we do dirt and blast and conventional tunneling and road tether and whatnot, but primarily in tunneling industry, TBM dominates. And of course, they have set all types of records in terms of daily advance rates, and uh, we have grown to fairly large sizes of TBMs right now, and they've become very powerful and very flexible too. And um, they, they do have a lot of uh, gadgets and goodies to uh, deal with the adverse ground conditions. Uh, of course, at this stage, we have TBMs that can be used pretty much in any type of ground. <clears throat> and um, so <clears throat> if we know what type of ground we're going to mine, we know what, what type of machine to put in and uh, what type of auxiliary uh, uh, equipment to put on it so that we can pass through. But the question is how fast? And what's the daily advance rate? Uh, advance rate? What's the project schedule? Uh, the fact is that ground does affect machine performance, and uh, having ge correct geotech allows us to do a, a reasonable job in machine selection and also accurately estimate the uh, performance and project schedule. Of course, <clears throat> the difference between geotech and tunneling versus uh, other civil applications is that most construction work is on the ground, meaning that as long as you can deal with the foundation, you're good. However, tunnel is in the ground. So all the variability along the tunnel impacts the uh, operation. And <clears throat> on top of that, um, we have typically the uh, owners, uh, the public that don't know much about this and how it can impact our operation. So we have to try to uh, actually educate the owners and public about these issues. Of course, the selection of the machine is typically based on the size and the ground, and it comes down to simple fact. Are the roof and walls stable? If they are, we can actually go with a certain type of tunneling methods, including open type TBM. And if the walls are not, then you have to go through to shield the tunneling. And of, of course, the second question is that, is the face stable? And that determines what type of system you have to actually use for its phase stabilization. And of course, groundwater conditions is a totally different issue that comes in in soil and rock, and you may have to use pressurized phase tunneling. So for machine selection, if you go to different uh, publications, you can find out what is the recommended method for 
Pushkin selection, and it follows the three steps that I mentioned. The stability of the walls, the stability of the face, and dealing with water. And based on that, you can go to TBMs, and of course, shielded TBM, and closed face or pressurized face TBM. Of course, when it comes to rock, um, you know, rock mass classification plays a major role, and, um, you know, based on a simplified system like RMR or Q or I system or others, you can actually see what machine can work better. However, it generally speaking comes to this graph if you want to uh, summarize it. Of course, the top tier is the rock tunnel, the TBMs, starting with the open machine, then going to the double shield machine, which actually is a shield, but it has gripper, so it can actually function as both. Then you can have single shield machine where you build the segments and push against it to go forward, but this all top tier are uh, essentially open mode machine there they don't offer face pressure whereas in the soil you need face pressure that you can use either epb air pressure balance machine or celery or a hybrid thereof and if we have to cut rock in the face at the same time offer face pressure we have certain type of machine it could could be actually either epb or celery or hybrid but with the cutter head that can cut rock. So this is a very simple classification. Each of these machines have their own handicaps and area of application, and also workflow for operation. This is a table recently published by German Dow uh, in 2021 about you know, application of different machines and where they can be used in the types of ground, uh, in terms of ground support. So we have main beam type machine. The largest one right now is 14.4, uh, which was used in Niagara Fall. You can see the side of the machine. We have all type of shields from digger shield to actually closed face and pressurized uh, face machines. Devil shields are um, fairly common in rock now, and they're almost becoming dominant because they have the capabilities of both uh, hard rock and uh, shielded machines, especially with a lot of unknowns because they can actually establish uh, and build rings in the back end of the machine. So it can go through unknown systems and, you know, uh, fault zones. You can see a larger one here from Spain. And of course, when it comes to soft ground, we have the giant machines like the two that you see. These are the biggest auxiliary machine on the left and uh, air pressure, uh, pressure balance machine on the right that has been used in recent years. So we have actually grown in size and by growing this in size, you're actually growing in risk almost exponentially in uh, variability of the ground that each cutter head has to deal with at any given time. But with all of that, let me start talking about some of the case histories. Uh, <clears throat> when I started working at Colorado School of Mines back in the early 1990s, um, one of the first projects I started working on was this uh, Twin Peaks Tunnel in Colorado Springs, which was pretty close to us about hour and a half drive. It works in Kronitz somewhere at the contractor, a small machine, three and a half meter diameter. Uh, five, length of the tunnel was four or five miles, let's say seven kilometers, rock type granite, but it was primarily pegmatite, which means larger crystals. And of course the machine could not add, penetrate as uh, fast as the strength would show. And there was different side condition. What we did was to essentially get uh, rock samples and perform full scale linear test in the rock samples obtained from the site. And we proved and showed that grain size of the granite actually did matter. And it was um, you know, more difficult to cut pegmatite with larger crystals than a granite of the same strength, but with a moderately uh, you know, grain um, you know, texture. Uh, right around 1990s, there was another project that we got involved with at uh, School of Mines. It was a 10 mile or 15 kilometer tunnel, about seven meters roughly in diameter, by Kivit, Atkinson, Kenny under uh, the ocean in Boston. Essentially, it was an outfall. And the main claim was uh, actually that they anticipated to go 15 feet an hour or say five meters per hour versus what they actually got was nine feet an hour or three meters out. So it was a penetration rate claim. At the time, the project was due $200 million. Just this uh, penetration rate claim was 54 million. And of course, there was another claim on the grouting and water ingress coming in. So both of them had hindered the project and created a huge claim. 
right about the same time, there was this Queens Tunnel in New York. Again, you can see the parameters about seven kilometers, roughly about seven, seven and a half meter diameter, not very deep, 200 meter deep. And the contractor, Kiwi Shea, was working on it. And again, they had a penetration rate claim, meaning that in this case, the problem was not the rock strength. However, the claim was that rock was not as jointed as uh, uh, you know, anticipated and established in the geotech report. Therefore, uh, they thought that they were entitled to some differences. So if the rock is too hard, uh, there are going to be problems. If the rock is not hard enough, in some cases, as is projected in geotech, it's going to be problematic. Of course, at the same time, there was another pro project going on, almost parallel to this uh, water tunnel number three. And uh, the issue there was not the rock hardness or joint, was actually rock abrasivity and the con configuration and texture of the minerals, where at that project, they encountered more garnet than you know what was anticipated. Also, and made a claim because of the color change. Uh, early 2000, this uh, Sabre Capilano project in uh, British Columbia uh, was put to bid in 2004 and actually started mining. There are two twin tunnels, um, about seven kilometers each, uh, 3.8 meter diameter, about three to 600 meter deep. And the rock was granite and some part was actually weathered granite. But as the tunnel moved forward, they started seeing uh, spalling and crushing of the rock in 5 and 11 o'clock position, meaning that there was very high in situ stresses. And when it was measured, it was two to three and a half times horizontal, you know, component of stress that was not projected in the geotech information. And of course, after discovery, we found out that there uh, was a discussion about it earlier in the project, but the, con uh, the designer decided to ignore it. However, it came down and you know uh, started catching up with the rock uh, crushing in the invert and crown. And finally, in January 2008, there was a rock burst and actually brought everything to a halt. You can see the picture in the lower right-hand side of the area that rock burst hit and the, the, the wall collapsed completely. And in the dispute between the two parties, the contractor, the first contractor was actually terminated. A second contractor brought in to finish the job. And there were over $100 million, actually $120, $30 million in claim just for a project that was $150 million to begin with in the bits. Another monumental project I'm sure many of you have heard of is St. Goodhart Base Tunnel in Alps. Of course, many very complex uh, Pro, uh, project with a uh, twin main high-speed rail tunnel and service tunnel, all together about 150 uh, you know, kilometers. About 100 kilometers of it was mined by TBM. But they had to change the diameter here uh, between the TBMs and had to use open type machine, primarily because of the high in situ stresses. Uh, you can see the schemes here of some of the you know, connections and whatnot. The main problem in the project was anticipated ground squeezing, which would get up to about roughly three feet in diameter. Imagine a machine that's about 10 meter and you lose about three feet of the diameter in uh, ground convergence. But of course, here they were a little bit you know, uh, prepared and uh, did not have much of a problem because they used open type machine and allowed for some deformation before they apply the full uh, ground support. In 2001 and two, essentially, we bought a couple of machines for this project, Goldberg in Iran. Altogether, fairly long project, but uh, essentially brought broken into five lots, uh, lot, lot uh, four and three. I was working with the contractor at the time, helping them understand what to do. The diameter of the machine was a four and a half, but three and a half meter ID with using segmental lining with hexagonal configuration. A double chip machine was selected and uh, went into the ground. The problem was in this project, even though it is shallow, and it was quite surprising to a lot of us, uh, but because the schistosity uh, of the rock and presence of uh, minerals and uh, you know sheer features. 
there were a lot of conversions anticipated, and we thought that we might get away with it, right? And projected um, some potential for severe squeezing, but nevertheless, we didn't think that it's going to catch on to us so bad. But it did. Uh, the project started converging to the point that it actually trapped the uh, shield, and they had to go in, cut through the shield, and manually release the machine. This was a about a five, six month delay. You can imagine the cost of that and the impact on the project. The machine got trapped at least twice. The third time was a little bit less, but anyway, at the, uh, the first one was really serious, five, six months. The second, um, you know, a few months uh, as well. Now, um, coming to the next project, again, giving you a spectrum of what could happen with TPM tunneling. This is the Rock Horse Mountain Tunnel. It's a 26 kilometer. 6.7 meter diameter, uh, devil shield TBM was selected to run the machine, again with the hexagonal uh, precast segmental lining. You can see some of the specs of the machine here. You know, we thought that it would be a typical project. This is the geology. The section that you see here, the green, is a formation which is known to uh, be hosting some of the uh, oil and gas reservoirs in, in west and southwest of Iran. At the time, the consultant actually dismissed the problems with oil and gas and uh, any related products. So they thought this limestone is far away from the reservoir, might just uh, you know go through, no problem. However, in reality, what happens was that uh, when they hit this limestone formation because of the permeability, and then uh, groundwater table and a mixture of the groundwater table with gas is rushed in. So you can see how much water was coming in and along with it, it was uh, gas, both methane and uh, hydrogen sulfide that came in. And uh, as you can imagine, you cannot work in that environment of hydrogen sulfide and they have to actually abandon the pro project for a while, come back with mitigation plan and go ahead and recover the uh, project. So you can see the tar coming in between the segments. Um, this graph is very interesting. It shows the amount of uh, actually discharge of the water into the tunnel. And along with it, as the discharge went up, the H2S that was being released um, actually uh, increased to the point that they had to shut down the operation. You can see with the H2S gas coming in, right? They had to abandon the, uh, you know, the tunnel for long periods of time and uh, zero utilization. Essentially, they had to go back and uh, recapture all the water right at the face to the point that they could, uh, as close as they could get to the face, put it into the pipe, pump it out so that it doesn't get exposure to the tunnel. Therefore, they could uh, somehow protect and prevent the um, gas release into the tunnel. Um, of course, the recovery was very painful. They had to go in with a PPE level D and uh, you know, fully equipped uh, with even oxygen to go in. Even in the process of uh, recovery, unfortunately, at one point the crew uh, became complacent and didn't use their PPE to the level that they should have. And of course, we had two fatalities in this tunnel. Nevertheless, um, uh, it was recovered and co they continued working. One of the things that was interesting and a very important uh, lesson on the TBM was that the entire tunnel and the back of machine, up of the machine, the machine, uh, they had to be redone to be, you know, gas uh, and explosion proof, and also uh, corrosion proof because of the H2S that came in. Very costly uh, refurbishing of the machine under these conditions. One of the recent projects, again, uh, in your neck of the wood, it, this is in Oma, uh, Oya project in Sri Lanka. Again, uh, it's a complex of two dams and, uh, you know, intersecting tunnel, a head race and powerhouse, and of course, generating close to 120 megawatt of power. These are some of the uh, uh, pictures from the site, the uh, concrete segment factory, again, on the site and the main portal for the uh, head race tunnel. <clears throat> this is the uh, schematic of the project. You can see it's fairly complex, and the head race, uh, which is 14 kilometers, is going to supply water into the uh, powerhouse, and then the tape race of it, about roughly three and a half, four kilometers, will take the water away. 
And uh, this is a picture of the cavern. <clears throat> in uh, reality, uh, when the machine hit the ground, the ground was uh, quartzitic in some sections, very, very hard. You can see these are the chips coming out of the face. This is how the face would look like. The machine could not really penetrate more than one or two millimeter and created much of a problem there in terms of uh, advance. This is what happened to the cutters. And you can imagine this is a nightmare for crew to keep up with the cutters. And the ground is very unforgiving, especially the ground that is so hard. Uh, once they could actually manage to pass through some of the hard zone, unfortunately, another uh, tragedy hit, and that was the amount of excess groundwater that was gushing in. At the first uh, uh, incident, they had up to about a cubic meter per second, and they tried to stop and mitigate it by uh, ground injection. But you can see it at one point it was close to inundate the machine. Uh, the past through of first zone it created a lot of headache for the people on the surface because of the subsidence and drying out the wells and rivers, of course, impacting the community there, community of farmers. The second uh, you know, time that they hit the water, it actually went up to about four cubic meters per second at the beginning and then uh, leveled down at about one to two cubic meters per second. In four and a half meter diameter tunnel, you can imagine, a couple of cubic meters per second water coming in, it would inundate, you know, uh, the uh, machine. Of course, they were going in a positive uh, grade, so, you know, the machine didn't get flooded. However, it caused a lot of social problems, a lot of technical problems for uh, pre-excavation, grouting, and, you know, other mitigation plans. This is not unique to, my, uh, to tunneling. Actually, micro tunneling um, has the same issues. This is a project uh, in Chile. Uh, uh, up, um, essentially, this is a, uh, sort of an outfall going into the Pacific Ocean for a water desalination plant. You can see the geology here was so intermixed that they couldn't even classify. They called it unclassified rock. And of course, the machine going in under the ocean with the, such a broken ground, it had to do a lot of intervention under hyperbaric conditions. And the smaller machine is a lot, lot more ex, uh, com, uh, you know, complex and problematic. We finished the job, but there was a lot of large claims going along with it. Um, next project uh, is actually Northgate Tower project in Seattle. Uh, of course, this was a typical uh, subway tunnel in glacial till and sand, um, not very long per se. It was roughly about six, seven kilometers. And uh, <clears throat> the machine, um, the, the, the contractor used two, one Robbins machine, one Hitachi Zosin machine. The tunnels were completed and, uh, you know, there were not many issues with the TBM. However, when the machine pulled out, as you can see in this shaft, this is the Hitachi Zosin machine that came out. Everything was fine. However, uh, it showed a little bit of a problem around here. So it had hit a boulder. And if this boulder was going to be, you know, earlier in the alignment, it could have caused major problem. You can actually see the footprint of the boulder uh, as it cut the groove into the cutter head um, structure. They were lucky that they hit this feature very close to the shaft. So essentially, they just kept pushing and they punched through. Uh, nobody saw the boulder, but um, if this had happened earlier in the project, it could have been causing a lot of issues and required an inter uh, intervention. And hyperbaric intervention is risky, time consuming, and costly. Uh, you know, in a few days uh, of the intervention, of course, it means that. Uh, you lose millions of dollars in productivity. Uh, of course, coming back to Seattle, uh, SR-99 Alaska Way, Wyduck, this was the largest EPV machine. And of course, uh, it is the largest EPV machine in the world. At the time, it was the largest ton TVM in the world. And the geology is my, primarily sand silt and, you know, with some cobbled boulders, very close to uh, Elliott Bay, meaning to open water. And you can see the profile. Uh, and you can see the specification for the machine pretty stringent and pretty, you know, uh, substantial. I mean, think about the power 
uh, 22 megawatt power going into the machine, being able to actually pressurize the chamber to 10 bar. So it's pretty nice. And of course, it went under uh, downtown Seattle uh, under a lot of high rises and whatnot. Very complex and very sensitive project. You can see the profile here uh, with different uh, you know, formations. Of course, at the beginning, they had to deal with sand and uh, had major issues with uh, maintaining uh, face pressure, uh, very slow um, movements. And of course, uh, when they were about 1,000 feet or 300 meters into the tunnel, um, something happened to the cutter head. It seems that they had to uh, essentially replace the cutter head. There are discussions about running into uh, steel um, structures and pipes or maybe uh, you know beams uh, due to the size of the claim uh, a lot of this information has not been released uh, unfortunately however away from running into the micro pipes with the steel or other steel features or not the face pressure was an issue shaft and uh, you know at the bottom of the shaft we removed the cutter head had to re do a lot of repair of the cutter head change the main bearing and put it all back together. Uh, you can see this is the picture of the machine, the bottom of the shaft. And it was uh, essentially repaired, reassembled, and finished the job. Uh, when the machine got into the clay, uh, subsequently, it went really well, and it was just amazing uh, of you know the results that it got with the machine. So coming to side investigation, we saw some of these. Um, projects and the question is uh, all right what is it that beside the investigation we can do to try to deal with some of these issues of course we do soil boring and uh, look at the you know soil and rock and uh, top of the rocks and situations sometimes we take trenches and sample uh, from the shaft especially for boulders and this is really critical if, because uh, soil borings cannot identify the boulders properly and it's been a big miss in a lot of projects that I've been involved with. Of course, we do core logging, you know, for soil and uh, rocks, and we go with lab testing between soil, rock, and deal with the groundwater, and a lot of in situ testing that we should do, including the groundwater table, which is very important, and then permeability by slug test or pump test. Uh, we do, um, uh, you know, borehole logging these days with optical or sonic televiewer is very, very critical. I just definitely recommend it because it would complement the core logging uh, drastically and show you what's going on. Of course, dilatometer and pressure meter test for uh, in situ properties of the soil and rock. And then if you're in rock, in situ stress measurements are very, very helpful, especially if you anticipate, you know, local. Um, uh, in situ, high institute stresses. Of course, th this is the list of uh, lab soil testing. Nothing surprising here. You know, this is the general characterization of the soil. However, when it comes to tunneling, and based on the experiences that we mentioned, uh, you can essentially list the issues as follows: like clogging of the clay in the color head. Um, is really a big issue. I mean, we have to avoid, it, especially in EPB. And EPB is the, uh, again, the most frequently used TBM in the world with earth pressure balance machine, which was designed and is designed for clay. However, if it starts actually going through clogging, it causes major issues. And uh, you can deal with part of it with soil conditioning. Nevertheless, understanding the behavior of clay is very critical. Abrasive wear on the machine is uh, important because if it causes issues, of uh, course, you have to do intervention under high pressure, and that is time consuming, risky, and very costly. The biggest, one of the biggest issues in TBM tunneling and soft ground, especially, uh, is boulders and cobbles. How do we characterize them, you know, uh, and then how do we quantify them? And uh, uh, ultimately, uh, there are even a discussion about the size of the cobbles and boulders, despite the fact that there are standards. But when it gets to the detail of how do you quantify, uh, the standards are not helping. For example, if you call the boulders 300 millimeters, what is that 300 millimeter mean? Is it in longitudinal side? Is it based on the circle? Is it the largest dimension, lowest dimension? So it comes in. 
that becomes very problematic because boulders and cobbles do impact the machine in a negative way. And uh, we need to deal with it. It's one of the most complex issues that we are dealing with. Of course, in embedded soil with fine and coarse causes a lot of problems of stickiness of the you know water ingress into the face. And uh, finally, it comes to ground surface settlement that we have to um, you know try to characterize by modeling. Dealing with the soil abrasion, we have been working on this at uh, Penn State where I started and then at uh, the current the current School of Mines dealing with the soil abrasivity. Most of the current measurements are based on the dry soil and that's a major problem because if you don't address the soil in this moist condition, you're missing the boat really big time. The graph that you see on the right is very important. Uh, this is the amount of wear in our equipment. I'll show you the equipment you know, as a function of time. The first group here is the dry soil, right? And you can imagine, you know, just that benchmark, think about 20 millimeter, 20 gram per 60 minute of testing, right? And these are different hardness material from uh, 17 Rockwell hardness steel to very hard steel. However, if the, water, if the soil gets saturated, the abrasivity goes down. Nevertheless, in between, there is an area when we are dealing with the damp soil where the abrasivity could go up drastically. I'm talking about one to two order of magnitude, meaning 10 to 100 times, not 10 to 100 percent, 10 to 100 times where could hit the system. So this is the testing system we have developed to address that issue and be able to actually measure and understand the abrasivity of the soil with water. Uh, it's a chamber we can put, uh, you know, um, soil, about 80 kilos of soil, all the way to uh, gravel in it without any alteration in the uh, grain size distribution. We put, this is the drill press that can actually uh, turn a propeller inside the soil. The propeller has some covers to actually compress the soil and have a, a, a direct high contact stress interactions. And then on the uh, you know, propeller, we have these type of covers. It could be any type of material from soft and mild steel to tungsten carbide and uh, chromium carbide. You can run the test on the material to see exactly in what type of soil, what type of uh, you know, uh, tooling would work and how it would work. In addition, we can actually use uh, dry, moist, saturated soil, even add foam and soil conditioning and uh, run the test. You can see this is a typical table, but let me summarize it for you here. In the graphs, you can see how stiff the soil can get uh, with different moisture content and in application of uh, foam and soil conditioning. But the graph here shows you again the weight loss or wear as a function of time. And imagine this is the same exact soil, same soil, same size, gray size distribution, same mineralogy. But if we so run the soil at 10% water content, this is the wear profile. It, it wears so quick, it's unbelievable. Then you go to saturated, you know, it's different. And then all the way to, you know, conditioned soil with the right conditioning, we can bring the wear down drastically. Uh, when it come, uh, by the way, in this uh, same machine, we have developed a system to look at the soil clogging as well with the clay, so we can change the moisture content of the clogging uh, soil and uh, deal with it and see how it can uh, be mitigated. I didn't have this slide for the interest of time. Of course, when it comes to rock, uh, this is the typical rock uh, property testing we do in a lot of labs. But the thing is, um, you know, we have to pay attention to some of the details. This is the core lock to actually uh, keep track of the fractures because the fractures dominate TVA performance, as we saw before. And we cannot do, uh, you know, um, a mediocre job, uh, as I said, with the uh, borehole logging these days, sonic or optical, we can actually get a good distribution of the joints and joint settings and have a better understanding of what's happening in the rock, especially with the voids. But when it comes to lab testing also, you cannot just cut a piece of rock and test it. You essentially have to look at the uh, pre-existing defect in the rock and see if the rock breaks along those 
uh, pre-existing defects and cause a structural failure. Because a lot of time, uh, this causes the compressor strength that's measured to show low. And in reality, this is what the machine could see when it's cutting the rock. Brazilian test, a lot of people know Brazilian test, but paying attention to the direction of schistosity or bedding is really critical because this allows you to see the uh, directional properties of the uh, sample and rock. And it's important because it controls the fracturing in the tunneling as you go parallel to the uh, you know, joints and bedding versus perpendicular to joints and bedding. And it could actually increase or decrease the performance by about 60-70%, sometimes by 100%. Surcharge test is specific to TBM, and essentially you can actually run the pin against the rock, look at the pin uh, where, and uh, this corresponds to cutter life. And again, in this field, uh, the type of measurement could actually make a difference because if you don't uh, measure this pin where flat properly, you could have some error in addition to the errors between the performance of the disk versus the rock hardness. So you can see different classes here, and there are uh, recent uh, advancement in this testing that can actually make these measurements more precise, so at least take away the testing errors out of the equation. Looking at the tin section of mineralogy and texture, uh, you know, it's a uh, not a guarantee, but an uh, insurance to make sure that at least if there is something unusual going on in the mineralogy, you can pick it up and look at the micro fractures here in the rock as well. This would be a tertiary, secondary tertiary effect of, um, you know, rock evolution over the time that could impact the uh, performance, enhance it or, you know, decrease the performance, but it's good to look at uh, rock texture on the tin section, especially for abrasivity. Point load testing, I am a personal advocate for this test because not only you can run the test axial or, uh, you know, diametral in the point load testing, you can test chunks. Also, uh, point load testing is a good uh, test for differentiating the rock anisotropy. And again, it impacts the TV performance. Punch test is something that I can actually run. This is a piece of cord that has been cast in a steel ring in hydrostone, and you penetrate a, a standard indenter into the rock. And if you look at this graph here, it tells you about rock brittleness, and uh, it does help understand the rock behavior. Now, of course, a specialized test like the Norwegian Sintef testing, which is a composition of three different tests, brittleness, Silver J miniature drilling and abrasivity. And when you combine these uh, tests, you can get the drilling rate index, cutter life index, and big rate index for TBMs, which is a good complement to the other rock mechanic testing that we do and can actually mitigate the risk in uh, geotech investigation. Of course, in situ testing, logging is critical, in situ stress measurement, pressure test for elastic properties, and of course, groundwater monitoring that could come very uh, handy and critical in operation like the one in Sri Lanka with the water ingress that actually killed the project and caused a lot of delays. So when we deal with the risk and geotechnical investigation, of course, you have to understand the perspective and the intent of the report versus the phases of the report, right? But <clears throat> bottom line is that after we do these investigations, we generate the reports. The common, the most common report at this stage is the GDR, Geotechnical Data Report. Although uh, GIR, Geotechnical Inter Interpretive Report or Summary Report has been around, however, GBR, Geotechnical Baseline Report, in tunneling is really critical. That's been recommended by ASCE. And uh, recently, Emerald Group out of uh, ITA Working Group number three recommends this uh, along with FIDIC for uh, contracting in tunneling. Because ge geotechnical baseline report is an interpretation which also has the risk uh, analysis embedded in it. And you can essentially come up with the risk sharing the scheme and develop a legal framework for compensation of the contractor in the terms of different site conditions. So GBRs are the way to go, but writing GBRs are tricky. I've seen bad GBRs too. 
So ultimately, it comes to risk management. So essentially identifying the risk and trying to come up with some sort of a responsible measure. Uh, down the lower left-hand side actually is the ratio of borehole to length of the tunnel. And you can imagine somewhere around 0.5 to 1 is the reasonable rate of uh, length of the boring to uh, tunnel, tunnel length that can give you reasonably good um, coverage and of course you have to do the right the right testing and developing a test met, uh, risk matrix come up with a potential risk uh, for a, any particular project and uh, you know uh, come up with the mitigation plan this is my recommended uh, general rule of thumb for tunneling uh, for allocation of the borings along the tunnel foot per foot of tunnel or meter per meter of tunnel as far as boring to the meter of tunnel and then you have to essentially come up with a way to uh, go beyond the tunnel for exploration. And as I mentioned, a specific and uh, specialized testing. Uh, just to enforce that, these are some of the major tunnel projects in recent works that has been logged by ITA. And um, you can see the amount of exploration cost in the investigation, geotech investigation compared to the tunneling cost. And um, although you see some high, uh, you know, exploration cost areas, these are primarily because of the lack of access. But three to four percent geotech investigation cost, relative to the cost of bid or cost of project, is fairly reasonable, and uh, we should uh, recommend that. Right. For a summary, of course, uh, geotech investigation is really crucial for construction of tunnels, and there are a lot of specialized tests that has to be considered, depending on the construction method. Uh, if we try to skip geotech investigation, we have to pay higher price in claims, and of course, owners typically pressure uh, the designers to reduce that budget, and unfortunately, the payback is really a big deal. Uh, Consultants and contractors, uh, you know, designers should educate the client about this issue. And of course, for the contractors, it's good to do some of their own uh, testing in addition. End of the day, a lot of us as geotech engineers get blamed for the project anyway. Uh, so be ready for that, but try to educate your, uh, you know, clients, and hopefully uh, aim for better products, better in terms of geotech report and more successful projects. Uh, again, I thank you for your attention. Be glad to take your questions right now, if there's any. So, thank you, uh, Professor Jamal. Uh, I'm afraid we don't have time for any questions as of now, but we'll get back to you, uh, the speakers. The delegates may uh, get back to you with any further questions later on. Not a problem. My pleasure. Thanks a lot for your insightful uh, uh, presentation and sure. highlighting the role of geotech investigations in, uh, in, uh, in optimum design of uh, underground construction through TBM. Thank you, Professor Jamal. Thanks a lot for your sure. time. Thank you. Sure. Take care. Thank you. So nice start today with this excellent lecture. Uh, now I would like to invite Dr. Florian Crane. Uh, before the presentation, I would like to give a brief introduction about Dr. Crane here. Thanks, for, thanks a lot for your time. Dr. Florian Crane, uh, a distinguished professional in civil and mining engineering, holds a PhD from the University of Leuven, uh, Austria, with a with a robust uh, background, Dr. Crane embarked on a remarkable, remarkable journey at GeoConsult in 20, 2004, contributing significantly to heavy construction engineering, particularly in tunnel design, various project phases. His extensive uh, experience en encompasses notable projects, including the preliminary design of Brenner Base Tunnel and geotechnical construction supervision of tunnel drives in challenging terrains. Since 2009, Dr. Crane has served as the MD of GeoConsult India Private Limited 
actively overseeing over 30 projects spanning underground metro, railways, and road tunnels, underground oil storages, hydropower tunnels, and slope stability assessments. His expertise, coupled with his uh, leadership, has left an indelible mark in the field, making him an invaluable speaker with a wealth of practical insights to share. So, Dr. Crane, thank you. The stage is all yours. Thank you for this flattering introduction. It's more the practice of giving so many lectures. <laughs> so today, um, well, I was invited to talk a little bit on the designer's uh, focus on NATM. I mean, as you know, GeoConsult is one of the companies who uh, spread NATM worldwide, so we are still very much linked to the evolvement of what started as a so-called new Austrian tunneling method. So just a brief overview of my presentation. I want to give some definitions, a uh, basic idea and approach, especially in the framework of the Austrian guideline. Then I come to something which I think is unique in NATM, that's the behavior type definition. Uh, consideration of failure modes, because that's something important in the design phase. Uh, and then I'll brush the construction concept, choice of support measures, and then what is vital then for the next step, but I will not cover the next step, that's the system behavior, because that's what we can really look at uh, in nature. We will not be able, hopefully, to see the failure mode in nature. So coming to the definition, I mean, I'll flip through that very quickly. Uh, we have our ground, which is composed of everything that's rock, soil, uh, the anhydrotrop <coughs> anhydropos, sorry, it's too early in the morning on Sunday, anisotropic properties, discontinuities, uh, and all the voids which can be filled with liquids and gases, as we heard already. Kelly. Uh, <clears throat> requiring that I have a very consistent and specific procedure which is used during the design process and is then also extrapolated to the uh, construction process. And the key influencing points are always the ground condition which is given and the ground behavior which I derive, but there I have already certain influence factors, and then what I'll do with that ground. And sideline, there is a lot of rating systems, and they have recommendations for excavation and support, and they are very valuable, but uh, still, the point is, after so many years of tunneling, we cannot say that they are comprehensive and we need to do the things on a project and ground specific basis. Because I cannot compare the Himalayas with the Deccan Trap. This is two different ground conditions, so different that in the one I can easily go with very little support and in the other uh, I have to change my support maybe every 10 meters. So the main I uh, guide this, so to say, the guiding principle is that I have a strategy which is giving me a consistent and coherent design procedure. And it should be traceable. So not that I have a delinking somewhere between the design and the execution part. Now the basic approach to the design, I think many of you might have seen that already, we determine the ground types, we determine the ground behavior, assign ground behavior types, we select our construction concept, we assess the system behavior, then there will be a detailed determination of the excavation and support method and evaluation of the system behavior in the supported area, which is also quite important. Uh, and then usually these two points are then coming already into the contractual sphere also. We have a geotechnical report and a framework plan which basically describes what the designer thinks has to be done. And then also determination of excavation and support classes, 
which is then really coming into contractual sphere. I will not touch that, but it should be known. And a very simple diagram, which always should be in mind when we talk about underground structures, we have the ground structure with the primary stresses and we have the groundwater conditions. All these play a role and also definitely the shape and size of my structure. Now in the guideline we have two areas where we have excavation because usually we will have a top heading running ahead which is giving me an area of influence where I have to look at. Then I have a supported section but when, once I come and do my bench excavation and the final excavation of the invert, I will have another area which I have to look at during the design. In many places there will be this cut and the simulations or calculations go on with that, but at some times it would be very wise to have a look into that separately. Now coming to the very general categories of ground behavior, as they are defined in this guideline. I mean, what we like most, that's stable. Then we have potential of discontinuity controlled block fall. That means my joint sets allow blocks to come out if I don't put in any support. And any support could also be a very thin uh, layer of sprayed concrete to just keep the blocks in place. Then we have the shallow failure, basically close to the excavation boundary. And then we are coming into the area where it becomes a bit more difficult. Voluminous stress-induced failure, that means that the ground cannot take the loads. And when I open uh, my tunnel, the stress redistribution induces failure, usually on the side walls. And then it can be a deep failure also. Rock burst is there. Buckling is there. That is something I have observed in certain areas of the Himalayas when the bedding is very thin and um, especially when no rock support in terms of uh, anchors is used, then I have a buckling of the rock. So I can have a uniaxial compressive strength which is fair, but with the thin layering my endurable uh, stress or the, the, the parent strength will drop down drastically. Then crown failure, which is basically that my uh, crown comes down like a big overbreak, a progressive shear failure. We can have reveling ground when it's rather dry, no cohesion, poorly interlocked and loosened soil or rock. Flowing ground when water is so to say, contributing to the erosion. Swelling ground, which would be like uh, some uh, ground which swells in contact with water. And then something we called in Austria this block matrix rock, where we have frequently changing deformation characteristics. Because we can have large blocks, small blocks, so it depends on the ratio between matrix and block. So now, coming to the behavior type, how it's been done during the design, there is a description of the behavior type which has to contain which ground type is it applicable, how does my discontinuity sets look like, and relative to the underground structure that has to be uh, pointed out here, the utilization of my ground strength at the tunnel perimeter and in the representative volume, Groundwater, a sketch of the expected ground structure with the excavation, description of the ground behavior, type of failure mechanism, long-term behavior, and other points which can be assessed at this stage. And then the magnitude of displacements and how it will look like and also the development over time that's basically coming from the long-term behavior. So this is now a very simple description of one ground type at an early stage of a project. Estimated values are shown here with shaded cells, so because sometimes we might not have the data or even with lab data we have to estimate because we have a range of parameters. 
And this is how it should look like when we define behavior types. That would be blocky failure. That would look like this. And this is a type 4 already where I have, so to say, higher displacements from the sidewalls because I have shear zones. I have very weak rock in the sidewalls. And that is, so to say, how it should look like that I have the primary stresses, groundwater condition. Ground behavior is then, so to say, narrative and the radial deformation in the sense that I say, okay, here I'm in the range of millimeters, here I'm in the range of several centimeters. And that I can then also monitor it nicely. Some common ground behavior types are those four and they are coming in nearly every project, uh, especially three and four, are interchangeable in the sense that the overburden stress has a huge impact on that. If I have a ground which looks not so strong and I have less overburden and the stress level is not that high, it may hold, but with, say, 500 meters and beyond overburden, I run into this voluminous stress-induced failure, which is more difficult to handle. And then coming to the failure modes, this would qualify as a behavior type 7. This is a model test that was done in the beginning of the 80s. And this failure type you might not see in the cross-section itself, because the support will hold everything in the crown, but it's an issue at the face. So we have to support the crown and stabilize the face in such a case. And that we find out during the design in the beginning by looking into these things. Now we go one step ahead. We have to select the construction concept. So in general, it should contain any ground improvement methods, any dewatering methods, my excavation method. Uh, will I go with blasting? Will I go with some mechanical excavation? The excavation and support sequence. Any pre-supports like uh, pipe roof. The support concept as such and the possible round length. I think the last point is something that is overlooked in several projects. I cannot have a lot of support and then I go up with my pool to three meters because that's a contradiction. I have to come down with my pool length also if I have a lot of support requirement. So this is the area to be considered. We need to check stability of the face, stability of the cross section with the support and stability during excavation. So that means any over uh, break and progressive failure coming out of that. And then for the construction concept, we evaluate the behavior type. We need to look into possible interactions. And as an example, four poling and pipe roofing. Um, I'll take that because the four poling should stabilize the open area. When I'm taking one round, I would like to have this material not coming onto my head. But the four poles have to have at least one abutment if we use them as so to say cantilevers, but better it is that they are embedded also into the, inside the ground and then we need a proper face bolting to have a stable face. Just a few demonstrative examples in blocky rock masses where the stresses are not exceeding the rock mass strength. I'll check usually or any designer will check the blocks formed by the joint sets. We will have a rather light support for pulling only as required to avoid any overprofile. And that, that's the note here. It can be a good rock with high overburden, but also a bit weaker rock with less overburden because my stress level is just so that I don't exceed the rock mass strength. And in weak rock mass, it becomes a bit more tricky. Usually, I would want to have long rock bolts to confine the rock mass even when it fails, stronger spread concrete lining, lining stress controllers, because I have a high level of deformation, temporary invert. I mean, this is just very general, uh, but it is depicting most of the things which have been done successfully in several projects. 
So this would be now how we look at the phase. Now this would be, if I take this, this would be the full phase excavation. If I make a top heading which is smaller, I am having a small wedge. Here I have the large wedge. So I have to stabilize my large wedge somehow to keep it in place. These considerations are missing in many places. And again, this would be the whole system for very weak ground. We have pipe roof, temporary invert, everything, including long anchors, to keep the tunnel stable in such a condition. One thing which I'm showing now since I think more than 10 years, this is the bedded rock mass. And this is advocacy for rock bolts. Because when I have this bedded rock mass and a side wall um, with a rather thin bedding, it may buckle in. If I use rock bolts, I can reduce this length for the buckling and automatically my side wall will take more load. Now coming to the end system behavior, we are basically then having our ground behavior. We are already having a support system which we defined in the beginning and then the whole thing is being taken into account, ground behavior, shape and size of the op opening, in considering also our intermediate construction steps, the round length excavation method, groundwater, again subdivision of the cross section and the support elements. And that needs to be analyzed and has to be compared to the requirements which are formulated in the very beginning. What do I want to have? In shallow tunneling, I don't want to have any settlement. In tunneling in the mountains, I can have some uh, displacement because there is no issue with settlement. So stability is one thing, serviceability in the final stage. I think this is very important. I don't want to have too much reprofiling. Compliance with all the environmental requirements, especially in urban environment. Displacements shall be within the acceptable limits. And I think very important, all these analyses have to be documented in a traceable and auditable format. Because then only I can go back into my design and change something if my ground condition changes substantially. And that's the last slide. Uh, influencing factors, I mean, we have many influencing factors and they are all very much spread. So we need not only one value, we need a range of values to see what is happening so that we can um, get a design which is robust. And the chosen construction measures also strongly influence the system behavior. So the choice of construction sequence and support measures is usually, or you know, when it's done beforehand, is usually an exception. It is to be done on site and it has to be varied to have a safe and economical construction progress. And what is usually the case, that if the required parameters cannot be determined with sufficient accuracy, I need a safety management plan. And then I'm coming to one thing which I have not touched so far, and that's the monitoring. In NATM, I have to do a monitoring, especially when the ground condition is challenging, to find out what is happening and whether my design is still valid. Otherwise, I have to switch the support class or I have to uh, somehow see whether the definition of my ground types and behavior types was wrong. With that, I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Dr. Crane, for your time and uh, uh, insightful uh, presentation and insights. Uh, now I request Professor Dipansha Shirole to extend our gratitude for the enlightening talk by Dr. Florian Ken by giving a memento as a token of appreciation.
Now, I would like to invite Professor J.T. Shahu on stage to extend our gratitude towards Professor Dipanshu Shirole for his efforts in the coordination and management of this session by presenting a token of appreciation. So, so now we'll head for tea, uh, and we will uh, rejoin at 11.30. And the first lecture will be from Professor Frost, who is already here. So uh, 11.30, we will reconvene. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a professor at IIT Delhi, in the Department of Civil Engineering. I'm the session coordinator. Uh, before uh, we start this session, a few housekeeping items. To remind us, uh, please make sure that your mobile is silent. And uh, for the session speakers, I'm the timekeeper for you as well. When you are about to finish your PPT five minutes before, I'll raise my hand so that it's an indication that you have five minutes left. Okay, thank you. Uh, so to begin with, so we have three prominent speakers for this session, uh, including Professor Frost. Dr. Hose and Professor T. Ken Singh. Uh, the first se speaker for this session is Professor David Frost. It's always a pleasure and honor for me to introduce uh, Dr. Frost, who is a pioneer in uh, research, consultancy, and teacher. And he has a lot of thing, uh, achievements added to his profile. In the interest of time, I'm making it very short. Uh, Professor David Frost is an Elizabeth and Hingenbotham, professor of civil engineering at Georgia Tech, and a co-founder of a software company, is a registered professional engineer in US and Canada. He is a leading expert on the study of analysis of natural and disa man-made disasters. He has served as on or led NSF-supported post-disaster study teams, and he's a founder, member, and co-chair of a Geotechnical Extreme Event Reconnaissance Association. And uh, last but not least, he has been awarded the Regents Entrepreneur by the University System of Georgia with over 200 papers published in reputed journals and conference proceedings. With this short introduction, I invite Professor Frost to deliver his lecture. Well, <clears throat> good morning, and uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the invitation to come and to share a little bit with you today. Um, uh, I enjoyed uh, the, the sessions, uh, the presentations I heard earlier today. Um, I will right on the front end tell you I am not a rock tunneler, but I think I study a lot of things that may in fact be quite interesting to the tunneling community and sort of taking a slightly different perspective on a number of things. And so in that context, uh, I decided to, to give a lecture today on what I call the role of interface compatibility in tunneling. Now, all right, so <clears throat> let me start off by saying uh, interfaces are ubiquitous in geotechnical engineering. Um, uh, when we do lab testing, they're all around us. Um, you know, the upper image I have there is the Casagrande liquid limit dish. And we like to think about that as determining the liquid limit of the soil. But if you actually look at the test, what it's really involving is the sliding of a soil against a copper uh, or a brass uh, uh, semicircular surface. It's an interface test that we're really performing there, and we, we, we have a relationship that we get out of it. In the middle, I'm showing base of a triaxial cell. One of the things that can dramatically affect the results we get from triaxial tests of any form is in platen friction. If we don't stop and think about the, the roughness of the platens that we put in, in, a, in a test, that's going to dramatically affect the deformed shape of the specimen and our interpretation of it. Our assumptions of uniform strain, for example, completely get thrown out of the window. And finally, on the bottom one, uh, I've got a, an image of actually a, uh, an interface shear device. So we actually do try and measure it. This is used either for soils or for interfaces between soils and other materials. When we move to the field, 
There are similarly interface tests all the time that are, are part of our process. Uh, in the upper, I'm showing uh, a portion of a cone penetrometer test. You heard that early, mentioned earlier today. And one of the important uh, three sensors in a typical CPT is the friction sleeve. But if you really talk to the experts, most of the time they don't use the friction sleeve because the, valuable seem, the, ver the values they get from it seem to be quite variable and they have difficulty in interpreting it. Well, guess what? Uh, in a minute, I hope I'll, I'll convince you that maybe it shouldn't be a smooth sleeve. Maybe it should have a texture of a different type. And finally, in the bottom, or the, the middle is a, what's called a borehole shear device. So you expand, it's a little bit like uh, somewhat of a pressure meter test, except that uh, you apply a vertical load to try and pull it out and measure the force. And finally, at the bottom is, is a, a load test going on of a tieback anchor, and, and obviously uh, you're, you're familiar with, with that, but that's essentially what's controlling that is the interface between the grout and the surrounding geomaterial or soil. And finally, then, when we get to geostructures, uh, certainly things like retaining walls, uh, um, soil nail walls, um, and, and up, up at the top of that image there, there's a, there's a, 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 a microtunneling device being lowered down into, uh, into uh, an access shaft. And the whole operations of all those is actually critically dependent on interface friction. Notwithstanding that, we actually don't spend a lot of time thinking about interface friction. In fact, if you talk to a lot of people and you say, well, what are you going to use for interface friction? They say, well, I'll use 65% of the soil friction, or I'll use 70% of the soil friction. And that, that, that's an opportunity, as far as I'm concerned, that we could do much better. Um, now, I'm going to start off and just simplify life by looking at what I call single particle geotechnical interfaces. And so here I have a circular particle moving along a smooth surface, a flat surface. And if you look at the dashed line, I'm tracing the axle of the wheel or the, the particle there. And you can see it's neither moving up or down. It's just constant, so there's no energy being expended in, in forcing the particle up or down. If I lock the wheel, in other words, I put the brakes on, and so I, I hold it at a particular, then the movement moves from being rolling, pure rolling, to pure sliding. It's like when you put the brakes on in your car too, fa too hard, or there's ice on the road, you lock the wheel, but you won't actually uh, slow down very effective. That being said, uh, if I actually have square wheels, uh, if I design the road, to be a bumpy road of the, the right characteristics, I can actually end up with a very smooth trip as well. If you notice the dashed line there, it's neither moving up nor down. So the, the, the relationship there between the particle and the surface is one that has been intentionally designed. And then on the other hand, if I lock and go, I move to the, to the sliding uh, position, now you can see that with the, the particle locked in one direction here, uh, it's moving up and down, so there's energy going to be dissipated in that particular interface. And finally, if I just rotate the particle, but I keep everything the same, as a function of the shape and the size of the particle relative to the shape of the surface, I actually move back to something similar to what I had before, and that dashed line remains horizontal again. Now, obviously, those are simplifications going down to single particle. But all of these processes are, in fact, what is happening at your rich interface uh, anywhere in a geotechnical system. You have multiple particles, multiple shapes. You've got rolling. You've got sliding. All of it is happening together. And so the, the key thing is, is that for all of these simple cases that I've shown you, they have different compatibilities. Uh, and if the compatibility is high, then there's not a lot of energy maybe dissipated um, through, for example, uh, rolling. Uh, there may be some dissipated through sliding. Uh, real geotechnical interfaces are obviously going to have elements of all of those uh, behaviors embedded into them and obviously involve multiple particles. So now, um, as I said, real interfaces are much more complex. There are two bilinear plots that I often reference when I'm talking about the performance of an interface. The first one is this, 
And this is showing the coefficient of friction versus normalized roughness. And this original pioneering work was done by a couple of Japanese researchers, Yushugi and Kishida, back in the mid-80s. Uh, um, and they showed that if you quantified roughness, then uh, as you increased the value of roughness, you got this essentially this bilinear relationship. Um, prior to that, by the way, people had typically referred to surfaces as smooth, slightly rough, and very rough. But in fact, there's a richness in the quantifying roughness that you can see here. Now, one of the interesting things is that if you look here, as you increase roughness, it starts to, the, the, the coefficient of friction increases up until you get to a certain uh, critical point, somewhere here, and then above that it goes constant. And the reason it goes constant is because uh, at that stage, the, the particles actually get caught in the rough surface, and the failure moves from the interface into the soil right next to it. But the bottom line is, is that there is a, an interface friction that can be achieved that is represented by that line. I would point out, by the way, that the, the red circle that I'm showing there at the left-hand end, that's what the smooth sleeve of the CPT gives you. It gives you that value. So the last time, uh, if I tried to convince you to take that data point and predict the rest of the, 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 the relationship, I think you would agree I was either playing some voodoo science or whatever, but it doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, the second plot I wanted to show here, and I'll, I'll, I'll be quicker on this one, but um, this, is, this is showing the log of the friction versus the log of normal stress. Uh, and this, uh, as you go at low normal stress, you can see that the value has, a, there's a certain value, and as you increase the normal stress, uh, then the value actually decreases, which initially you might see, feel like it's counterintuitive. But remember, that's because when we talk about stress here, we're talking about global stress, not contact stress. And what's controlling this behavior is contact stress, or if you like, Hertzian uh, uh, contact between the, the, the soil particles and the, 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 the continuum that it's against. As you increase the stress, at some point in time, you cannot increase the number of particles that are on the front row or at the interface. And so, in that case, if it's a very hard surface, you find that the value goes constant. But if I had a softer surface, you actually find that you reach a minimum value, and then it starts to increase. And that increase is reflecting, for example, plowing of one set of particles into the, 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 the uh, continuum or, the, or, the, or the, the surface. You can actually kind of envisage some of this, for example, as what happens when I have diamond inserts in a tip, uh, uh, w w perhaps uh, grinding into uh, a rock soil or whatever. So bottom line is, is that's an interface at a part of a scale as well. Now, against all of that, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is spend a little bit of time um, uh, giving you some insights from some past studies we've done, just to sort of show you the kinds of things that, that we've been discovering. Um, and then I'm going to jump and talk about a new framework and perhaps some inspiration for interface designs going forward. Um, uh, here is, I would say it's not a comprehensive, but it's a fairly comprehensive list of factors enhancing or limiting the compatibility at interfaces. And you can see things like relative roughness, hardness, asperity shape, asperity spacing, ridge versus valley features, wear, lubrication, clogging, arching, mineralogy, and then on on down the other side. Many of them are related to the individual particles, things like fabrics, things like surface directionality temperature sensitivity, and probably some others. So I could probably give a half hour lecture on each of those to explain why it's important. I'm not going to, that's the good news. But what I wanted to do is by showing you this list is to help you appreciate that there is an incredible richness if you understand what's happening at an interface and particularly in terms of the compatibility between uh, the materials at the interface. Um, so few uh, insights from past studies. Um, when we started looking at, at roughness, I mentioned the cone penetrometer as one example, and we said, well, what if we put texture on a sleeve? 
Um, and in fact, we said, well, what if we put texture on multiple sleeves in sequence? Perhaps we could get a lot more data from the comb penetration test. And so rather than changing the existing comb, we just built an attachment that goes on behind the cone, and we put four sleeves on it. This is just a, a detailed uh, image of what's happening. We then ran a test, and the first test, we actually put four smooth sleeves on it. Uh, and so the idea was to see, does position of sleeve matter, whether it's the, whether it's the, the bottom sleeve or the top sleeve. And you can see here, there are actually four traces here. And so it's highly reproducible, no matter which one of the sleeves is going by. That was very good news for us, because then that meant that we didn't have to worry about baseline varying uh, as we moved sleeves by it. Where the real impact came was then we turned around and we added texture to the sleeves. And so you can see there are now four sleeves going from uh, quantitative smooth value all the way up to rough. And here are the corresponding profiles. And you can see there's a first order relationship between surface roughness of the sleeves and the, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the friction, the, uh, the force that you measure on the friction sleeve. And the reason that's happening is that there's a change in mechanism. If you remember that first bilinear plot, the red circle is for smooth. What's happening there is the particles are sliding by the sleeve and to be honest, the, the, the soil, one particle back, doesn't even know that there's a sleeve in the neighborhood moving by or doing anything. Whereas if you have texture on your sleeves, now what you start to find is that it actually engages a lot more of the soil and therefore is eliciting more of the interface friction in the system. In order to address an issue that I heard, we heard mentioned earlier today, clogging, uh, we realized that clogging was a potential problem, and so we said, well, how about we design surfaces that don't clog? And so we did lots of different tests. These are different sleeves. You can probably see there that there's different texture elements on it. And we ended up coming up with a single design that avoided clogging in all types of soils, but, and, and, and so we were able to perform the test without having to change sleeves because we're in one soil type versus another soil type. And finally, and with a sort of a little bit of a jump in the presentation here, this is what we were able to produce without any putting in any fudge factors or anything else. This is coming straight from measurements we made with the attachment of the cone. And guess what? We could actually generate the bilinear plot uh, in situ with a single test. Uh, uh, so, so we really felt that this was a, was, was a huge opportunity. Um, so the, the important thing again is the varying compatibilities yield different interface responses. Now, some in pipe insights from curved pipe surfaces. We were interested in, so what, what's the role of surface roughness on the interface friction of some of the different pipes that, for example, you might be using in pipe jacking or micro tunneling uh, various products. This is just a, 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 an image of a, of a, of a jack uh, system. Here are not all the ones we tested, but as an example, there's a, there's a Hobus uh, fiber reinforced polymer pipe, there's polycrete, there's vitrified clay, and there's steel, many of the common materials that you're using in pipes. Here are the surface roughnesses of those different pipes, and these are all to the same scale. And you can see that once you start to look at them, they're dramatically different. And now, for you, you might say, well, yeah, but look at the size of the scale. Yeah, but think about yourself if you were a, a clay particle or a silt particle or a sand particle. Uh, the vitrified clay is like standing in front of not quite a mountain, but a rather large hill. So naturally, you're going to, to, to feel different as you face that. Uh, we developed, because of the curved surfaces, we developed an interface shear device. And in fact, as you can see in the image in the, the right hand of the lower ones there, we actually designed the underside of the box. So it was curved, so you didn't lose material. Uh, and, and those curves are interchangeable depending on the diameter of the pipe that you wanted to test. And here's a plot showing again, guess what? The bilinear relationship holds up when you actually test the various materials. And again, <coughs> As you can see from this, some materials, the Hobus, for example, is much more like a smooth CPT, whereas some of the other ones, the vitrified clay and so on, have got a high roughness um, and therefore a much higher interface friction. Um, 
we also have done studies with lubrication because one of the things sometimes that, that you have to deal with is uh, you're trying to get as much, you know, the, the cost in some tunneling jobs is the access shaft. And so if you can push further from a single shaft, you can cut down overall project costs. The problem with there then is, is the longer the pipe you are pushing, perhaps the, the, the higher the jacking forces and eventually then you get exposed to things like buckling and so on. So we, we did some studies in that. Um, we have field data that we measured, and this is just showing you uh, uh, the, the red dots are um, the actual jacking forces, and the, the sorry, the, the, the blue are the actual that were measured in, by, at the, at the, in the field, and the red were actually predictions that we did ahead of time as to what we thought the friction would be uh, for sections along this, and this is what, a 350 uh, 350 foot push, push uh, uh, of, uh, of a jacking system. And you can see that we were able to nail it right on uh, depending on when you turn the lubrication on and off. So we're able to control the jacking forces and get a much further push by, by take, paying attention to lubrication in the area of the interface friction as well. And this is, although this is not a, a particular pipe material, we've also studied, for example, temperature effects because, uh, again, uh, some materials that we deal with are, are really not that sensitive over the range of variations we see, but others are, and there's, there's a, there, there can be significant improvement or a variation in, in, as a function of temperatures. So, a new framework for geotechnical interface designs. Uh, I want to start off by saying, first of all, I mean, here are some of the materials that we do deal with. Steel, FRP, concrete, timber, uh, and various geomembranes with various surface roughnesses, and I could add many more to this table as well. Importantly, if I just look at some of the, the properties of these materials uh, and just look at two of them, either the, the, the average roughness or the Brunel hardness, and perhaps here are some materials that, that I might be using in some of these particular uh, applications, infrastructure applications, you can see that the values range significantly in terms of, of roughness. They go from, in, in micron meters, they go from 116 all the way down to 0.3. Um, and in Brunel hardness, they go from uh, 48 down to 1.5. And yet, we pay no attention to these factors when we're designing systems. We just say, oh, it's a pipe. I'll worry about the diameter of the pipe. Don't forget the characteristics of the pipe. You know, you, you've, you hear many people talking about the importance of the mineralogy of the different rocks types and everything. Let's give the same respect to the pipe or whatever we're trying to jack. It has an important role to play in the behavior as well. So the other thing, though, that I wanted to kind of, as a framework, to, to, to help people think about well, what am I doing, what am I building? And I'd like to propose that I think there's kind of what I would call four <coughs> maybe main, major, major categories of interfaces. One is what I might call a preformed interface. In other words, that's something that I can look at it on the ground, it's there, it's a piece of pipe, and I install it in the ground, and I'm not changing it per se uh, very significantly around. There are other interfaces that I might be able to actually uh, form them in situ. In other words, I put uh, different components that make up the interface together and, and depending on what those were and in situ. And that becomes particularly important when we recognize, for example, that we're going from different soil types or, or different uh, geomaterial types, even along the length of a push or whatever. Uh, adaptable interfaces. You know, nowadays we keep hearing about the importance of developing systems that are adaptable, and I think we're going to continue to hear that more and more. And finally, I'd be remiss if I only thought, said that I was going to talk about structural uh, or mechanical issues. Uh, thermal interfaces, I think, are a huge opportunity for us as well. Um, the other thing that I'm, again, again, I'll note is that all of these embody different degrees of compatibility. So now, uh, so what about some ideas for new types of interfaces? Well, here are four infrastructure problems that probably all have something that could be part of the, 
the tunneling world that uh, obviously on the left is, is a micro tunneling system. Uh, there's some geogrid reinforcement. You know, a lot of times we're, we can we can avoid uh, perhaps tunneling by by having some slope stabilization systems in place first. Uh, then other places we may need to move to ground anchors for different types of stabilization. And finally, thermal. And all of these things are happening underground. So what might be some source of inspiration? Well. Have you ever thought about snakeskin? Snakeskin is a very fascinating material in that it has different roughnesses depending on whether you're looking in the cranial or the caudal direction. Uh, and so now, as you start to think about it, it may be easy to push in, but difficult to pull out because of, of the, how the texture is directional. Similarly, um, for geogrids, have you ever thought about the fact that you know spiders have been in that business for quite a few years and seem to make some fascinating structures? And so I'd like to say, that, think about doing some spider web inspired geogrids. Maybe there's some opportunities there. Tree roots, well, they do multiple things, but one of their functions uh, is, is uh, ground anchoring or, or rooting. By the way, uh, an important point about tree roots is they nominally do four or five functions. We, as humans, tend to limit ourselves at most of the time to trying to do one thing with a particular system. And that means that it's expensive. There's opportunity to do a much better job when um, uh, we start to think multifunctional. We now build something that can actually fulfill or satisfy multiple needs. And finally, for, for uh, some of the thermal things, you know, there are many natural systems out there that have phenomenal structural and thermal properties, and I'm just showing an example here, some bamboo, uh, bamboo stems and so on that have different structures at different scales. Now, you might sort of say, okay, that guy's, he's, 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 he's yapping off the top of his head, he's not really catching my attention. Uh, I'm in a room here with, with probably some of the best in, in tunnelers in the world. Uh, we've heard people talk about tunnel boring machines and everything. Do you know that ants use less than 0.1% of the energy per unit volume to excavate than the most efficient human tunneling machines? Yeah, newsflash, we are being outperformed by ants. And of course, uh, I'm not gonna talk a lot about them further today, but I think that that's a fascinating uh, thing that you say, well, why? How are they able to do it? And so we've actually been studying it, and, and uh, you know, uh, one of the things they do is they don't do their site investigation a year ahead of when they go to do the tunneling. They do it at the same time as they're doing the excavation. So they do little geophysical tests, and if they find that a, a piece of, of um, aggregate is doing a lot of important work in holding the tunnel up, they don't touch it. They go and they remove another one that's easy for them. So, so they don't want to waste energy um, moving particular things like And they allow the ground to then adjust uh, the stresses themselves and control it. And by the way, they don't have many collapses in tunnels when, when ants are in charge of the business. Um, um, uh, the um, shafts that tunnels excavate uh, near surface, they tend to be elliptical. As they go deeper, they become circular. Uh, if you look at the elliptical shafts, they actually have a very gentle spiral. And we've taken that and we've been looking at uh, doing numerical, we've done numerical modeling with it, and guess what? They're playing around with the stresses and they're ending up with more stable structures because of how they're changing the orientation. Uh, likewise, the, the uh, nests that the, the ants build when they're excavating underground, those completely assist in limiting stresses, vertical stresses, and allows them to achieve uh, things underground that they otherwise could not because they're not, they're, they're not in charge of, or they are in charge of the stresses. So bottom line is, is don't, don't dismiss it as some sort of a kooky professor who's got a lab full of ants and worms and trees and plants and everything else. Nature has a huge amount of lessons for us. And there are essentially three things that I think are very nice about what nature does. First of all, they're adaptable. Uh, secondly, they're energy efficient. They hate wasting energy, not like us as humans. Um, and and um, 
so, so um, take a look at that. Now, let's go a little bit further and talk about preformed interfaces. Here is the snakeskin inspired. Um, 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 so we measured the surface roughness. This was a former PhD who worked with me, uh, Alejandro Martinez, measured the surface roughness. Here's actually the profiles of the surface roughness, and you can see that there's a directionality to it. It's rough in one direction, smooth if you're pulling it in the other. He did tests in a centrifuge where he put these textures onto different model piles and so on. And uh, then finally, uh, some similar work that was done here at IIT Delhi uh, by uh, our moderator for today, Dr. Vangela, where he looked at uh, snakeskin-inspired uh, surfaces on split rock uh, uh, split sets. Um, and again, did tests in the lab. And you can see that from the results without getting into a lot of detail here, but there are differences in the response depending on whether you're pushing it or pulling it. So just something as simple as thinking about the texture and directionality offers lots of opportunity. In situ formed interfaces. So here are four graphs of uh, uh, geogrids. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with the geogrid for reinforcement of slopes and things like that. Uh, going from the left, there's a biaxial, which is basically square openings. Then there's a triaxial, which is triangular. The, the third one is what's called interax. This is the, the most recent product that has sort of hit the market and is catching a lot of attention. And then finally, the one on the right, which I happen to think has got the coolest name, is spiderax. And the inspiration for that came from, from spider webs. Uh, now, when you look at an image like that, probably other than the fact that you can kind of get a sense of it, not much comes out to hit you. But if I color code based on the opening sizes in the grids, now you start to see a different picture. The original two products only have one opening size. And so you have to start to question, hmm, is that, is that an optimal? Is that a good idea? Or should there be, if we had different opening sizes? The Interax project has moved towards the direction, and the, the Spiderax is moving even further in that direction. Now, I've plotted here, again, those four geogrid systems. Um, but in what I've also plotted here now are histograms, incremental histograms of the opening sizes. And so you can see that, for example, in the upper left, all of, the, all of the openings are at one size towards the right-hand side of the plot, and the others have various distributions. I've also plotted in the middle the, the, the incremental plot of the grain size distribution of the material that typically uh, people installing geogrids are told to use. And here is actually the way you're probably more used to seeing it. It's as a gradation or a range of gradations. And if I just showed you these and I say to you, which is more compatible? To be honest, uh, I think um, there's a completely missed opportunity so far uh, in the reinforcement world uh, as to what, um, uh, how we might optimize or improve designs. Um, the other thing I wanted to show you is that uh, in the upper two plots there, those are Interax, which as I said is the newest product on the market, and then Spiderax, uh, which we're, we're working with the same uh, manufacturer but, but developing. And, but as we, if we move from a sec, uh, primary cell to multiple cells, you can suddenly see nothing happens in the interax, it's just a repeating structure. But as you look at the spider ax, now you start to see a secondary structure emerging. In other words, apart from the smaller internal structure, there's this larger uh, uh, frame type of structure represented by the brown uh, openings in it, and as soon as we saw that, we said, I wonder if that's going to have an important role in performance. And in that context, we um, ha have done testing, and indeed, we're, we're able to start to see that thinking about that from a structural point of view is definitely beneficial. Adaptable interfaces, we talked about tree roots, we've taken some of those concepts and developed a technique now where we can install uh, an anchor in a, in a regular uh, hole and then expand it through a, an expansion system at the bottom, not just a load test. Here it is in the closed form. Here they are in the expanded form. And we did field tests. And here are the results of the field test. The conventional straight shaft grouted anchor is the red curve on the bottom. And the root inspired ground anchor, everything else being the same, we get 75% higher capacity out of that uh, just by 
coming up with a design to mimic what tree roots do. Finally, in terms of thermal tunnel interfaces, we're all familiar with uh, some of the needs to come up with ground heat exchange technologies, and lots of people took structural piles and then added sort of cooling loops in there. The problem with that is while it's starting to move to multifunctional, you inherit all the limitations that come uh, along with a, with a structural pile, including little space and so on. <coughs> We ran simulations of that using COMSOL multiphysics. The actual um, uh, existing technologies are represented the power by the lower blue curve there. And by coming up with some different configurations for what we call an engineered thermal transition zone, we were able to dramatically increase the performance. We've also run lab tests to do the same thing. And again, you can see here that we're literally uh, probably more than doubling the power and by the way, for the conventional, it was a 70 meter long energy pile. And for the new system, it's less than 30 meter long. So we get a much higher power, cons uh, power uh, consumption um, uh, for um, uh, a much shorter pile. And so, so what does that mean maybe for tunnels? Well, originally we were looking at piles and, and these were the various configurations. But we've started to think about some of these structures that I mentioned that nature has, and they have tremendous thermal capabilities, but they also have tremendous structural capabilities. And so there are perhaps ways that we could think about, maybe we just need to generate some, what we'll call thermal tunnels. We don't try and do anything else with them other than have some of these high thermal conductivity structures. But also, we can start to think about more and more about not only do we have a tunnel, but maybe we have an area surrounding the tunnel that we have high thermal properties that we engineer and design into it. And if we really need to go further, we can even change the shape. You know, remember the if you look at any, any motor that you have, there's lots of fins on the outside, and the purpose of those is cooling. So we're, we're not creating, it's proposing anything new here. We're just saying there are probably neat ways to, when we're building new tunnels, to not only think about the, the primary function, but to think about its role in the thermal world as well. And so, summary comments. Um, uh, the properties and performance of both materials as an interface are important, both individually and collectively. Uh, sometimes you, we, we test one or the other, but it's also important that we test them together because that's where we really start to see how they'll perform. There's, I think, huge opportunities for inter -desi interface design um, innovation. Um, I think we should not hesitate to question existing approaches and see if there's new inspiration that can lead to transformational, not just incremental changes. Again, let's let's use the word, let's use the ants as an inspiration. I'm not saying we'll get a tunnel boring machine all the way down to 0.1% of the energy of the current machines. But boy, if we can even get it to 1% or 10%, think about that, what the, what the implications of that, the positive implications of that. I really encourage to embracing bio-inspired solutions, particularly because also they are multifunctional, they're adaptable, and they're efficient. Uh, uh, as I said, all along, A, nature does not like to waste energy. Um, and, and so, um, and bottom line is in the end, I think we have the necessary tools, experimental, numerical, and visualization to really move and advance this field forward. And with that, uh, thank you very much for your time. And I, one person does, never does this on their own. I've had the, 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 the joy and pleasure of working with many, many people over the years, grad students uh, uh, and faculty colleagues, but uh, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge their contributions as well. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Foss, for the insightful lecture. Uh, just a minute, we have a token of appreciation. Now I request Professor Prashant Wangla to extend our gratitude for the insightful talk by Dave, uh, Dr. David Foss by giving a memento as a token of appreciation. The next talk is by Dr. Venetian Haas. Uh, I have 
a very good introduction uh, of Dr. Haas. So Dr. Haas is a distinguished principal, civil engineer, and director at Hamburg, as well as a vice president at ISEG. He is a recognized expert with over 25 years of global experience in design and construction. Dr. Haas has notably contributed to the field with the development of various methodologies and models such as the Venetian strength, failure criterion, and QD for concrete classification, and the I system, a comprehensive tunnel method. His impactful work extends to successful application in industries and academic institutions worldwide. With over 40 peer-reviewed international journal and conference papers, a published book, and the release of a professional software package called iSystem Software, he exemplifies excellence in design, communication skill, computational skills, and innovation problem solving, making him a valuable speaker and a contributor to the field of civil engineering. With this introduction, I invite Dr. Haas to give his presentation. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, this is the, today's uh, uh, keynote that I'm going to present for you. I-System Index of Ground Structure, a comprehensive classification and characterization system for ground, including rock and soil. Uh, this lecture would be uh, partitioned in two parts, part one, contains the design approach, I-system-based design procedure, and then we would be entering to the I-system, including the facts, application, features, scoring diagram, utilization diagram, input, indices and impact factors, calculation, I-class, IGC summary, and I-system software. In the part two, if we get time, we would be browsing the indices, impact factors, I class, including the main classes and the special classes, IGC, including the, all of the ground parameters required for design, GCD as ground conductivity designation, case study as USBR project tunnel T05, acknowledgement, disclaimer, and references. This is a design approach uh, that we are utilizing for design of projects, including tunnels, surface and semi-surface structures. It includes four main steps. Empirical as design practicality, analytical part, design core, seismic dynamic design, and observational. As yesterday, Dr. Dovan spoke about the classification. This is the empirical part, which uh, anyone can use any classification they like, or they may use, or they may be familiar for classification. In the analytical part, which is the design core, it is core of design for dimensioning and or verification using limited state design based on analytical and numerical analysis considering deterministic and probabilistic parameters using convergence confinement method, capacity demand analysis, hyperstatic reaction method or beam model considering ground load configuration, and water pressure. In the seismic part of the design, uh, which is dynamic design, it is uh, part that's uh, uh, working in cooperation with dimensioning the structure based on analytical analysis, considering transient deformations using free field deformation methods, pseudo-static ground structure interaction analysis, dynamic ground structure interaction, finite element method analysis, and dynamic air pressure methods. In the observational part, which is during the work, when you are making the slope, uh, station, or tunnel, you are going to use this part to be able to optimize the design. It is design adequacy. Assurance part of design, inadequacy of the applied solution based on encountered condition, considering probable condition and possible variation by 
empirical methods and engineering judgment using, in this case, I system. Considering this design approach that I explained, I have uh, developed a design procedure which is I system based design procedure. The first step in this design procedure is the data collection. Required data for I system and I system based design. Second stage is the ground zoning, a function of ground properties derived using I system. Third stage is the ground behavior based on mechanical responses and I system output. The next is the ground hazards, identification of associated failure and hazards with the ground behavior that you have already identified for the stretch. Next is the support system based on I systems classification output for each ground behavior and associated ground hazard. And the next is the structural dimensioning, which is calculation analysis for each support system based on I system characterization output for each stretch that you have already zoned. And finally is the structural verification relative safety margin for dimensioned structure based on I system characterizations output. I will explain a little bit further. This is the data collection in I systems design based procedure. It contains Geohydrological data, geomechanical data, geometrical data, geophysical data, geostructural data, and geotechnical data that we require in design procedure. Ground zoning, I have given two examples here. One is a tunnel in the left hand side, and another one is a, you can consider a slope, a station, semi surface structure. Based on the ground properties, based on the first step and application of I system for classification and characterization, you would be able to zone the tunnel or the surface or semi-surface structure. And the next step, based on the empirical analysis, again using I system and stability measures, strength failure capacity, and in parallel hand, analytical analysis using continuum or discontinuum modeling, mechanical responses, deformation, and plastic zone you would be able to judge about the ground behavior. If you want directly to use the I system, you would be able to do the data collection by a geologist or an engineer at face, and then analyzing the I system, getting the output of I class and IGC, automatically your ground behavior is with you. This is the ground hazards associated, ground hazards and types of failures with the ground behavior that you have identified in the previous stage. And now you want to do the, you, you want to determine the support system, required support system. Output of I, I system is I systems classification and I systems ground characterization. I system classification providing you all of the support requirements for tunnel, slope, or semi-surface structures. And then in the structure dimensioning, using the parameters that you have got from the I system's ground characterization, you would be able to do the analytical analysis required for your structure. And in the next stage, you will be doing the verification through ULS or SLS procedure. This was an introduction uh, to explain a little bit further why a classification system and a characterization system is so important. With this in mind, let's enter to the main discussion, which is about the I system. First, I would like to brief you about the facts against I system. I system equates index of ground st uh, structure. I stands for index. It's an indexing system. Course of development has taken about 22 years of research and experience in several projects. Case records 
of development contains 34 rock types and 11 soil types in nine countries. It is developed in wide range of rocks and soils from hard rock to soft soil. It was finalized in 2013 in Australia and tested for five years before first publication in 2019. It is not a RQD based system. It is not a modification to any existing classifications for rock or for soil. It is not developed to be only classification system. It is a ground classification and characterization system. It was in mind to have a meaningful and definable range for the scoring. It is a AI-ready system due to having almost all determinative features or properties of ground. Its underground output is applicable for any existing tunneling methods. This is a system that synergizes designers, site engineers, and geologists for an optimized design and practice. It does not replace investigation, but it is reliable enough when investigation is skipped. It was in mind during development that all parameters to be derived by a simple mapping of ground. The application of uh, I system is not limited to only rock. It is applicable for rock and soil in civil, mining, and oil and gas projects for underground structures, semi-surface structures, as well as surface structures. This is the first ever classification that applicable for all of these features, including the rock, soil, underground, semi-surface, surface, problematical configuration, a structural configuration, a scale effect, earthquake effect, excavation method impact, squeezing, swelling, heaving, viscoelastoplastic behavior, fully plastic behavior, time-dependent behavior, and burst-prone ground condition. A scoring diagram is shown here. It contains five indices and two impact factors. Indices AI, CI, HI, PI, and SI share 20% of the score out of 100 and it would be multiplied the summation of these five indices to two impact factors of DFI and ETI, and finally I, as the I value or I system's value, ranges from 100 to zero. 100 as the best ground, and zero as the worst ground. Utilization of I system is simple. Data collection is the first thing that any geologist engineer or designer should do at the face of the tunnel or at the slope. Then with the data which is collected, you would be able to calculate the indices as well as the impact factors. And so automatically your I system is calculated and it would be giving you two outputs. One is I class, which is the short form of I systems classification that can be used in design and in practice and second is the IGC, which is the short form of iSystems ground characterization, which can be used in design and design optimization. The input, as I explained, contains the range of geodrological, geomechanical, geometrical, geophysical, geostructural, and geotechnical data. Then in the second part of the lecture, I explain about the indices, you will get to know that what parameters required. Indices contains five index and two impact factors. AI is the armature index, which is, the ground, which is modeling the ground skeleton armature. CI is the configuration index, ground problematical and a structural configuration. HI is the hydro index, ground hydro effect. PI is the property index, which is the ground shear properties, including the texture, fabric, shape, size. And SI is the strength index, which is the ground strength behavior under confining a stress condition. DFI is the dynamic forces impact, and ETI is excavation technique impact.
I see SEM itself as this simple equation, and uh, it has engine to calculate five indices and multiply it in two impact factors, as shown in this slide. As I stated, output of I system is I class and IGC. I class is the classification. It would be classifying the ground to 10 classes. From I class 1 to I class 10. I class 1 representing the best ground and I class 10 representing the worst ground in terms of competency. Further to this, further to the classification, I class, or better to say that, a classification output of I system giving you six important parameters. Recommendation. Number one is the SS, required support system. Number two is the ET, excavation technique. It is recommending which type of excavation technique to be employed. Number three is the IT. It would be providing you the recommendation with instrumentation techniques. Number four is the PT, which is prevention technique. It would provide you with the recommendation how to pre prevent surprises and failures, collapses and instabilities. Number five is the FT, which is coming with the recommendations against the forecast techniques suitable for your project. And finally is the design remarks that providing keynotes, key info, uh, information, how to design the structure. Second output of iSystem is IGC, which is the iSystem's ground characterization. In this output, you would be having six parameters, ground mass uh, modulus of deformation, uh, uniaxial uh, unconfined compressive strengths of ground, uniaxial tensile strengths of ground, Poisson ratio of ground, internal friction angle of ground, and finally the cohesion of ground. All the parameters that you require in your analytical analysis. As a summary, I system application or employment of I system starts with the data collection, as I explained. And any geologist, any engineer or designer at the face of the tunnel or at the slope or the semi-surface structure, they would be able to derive these parameters without any specific testing, just by eyes. The parameters will be given to the equations in the AI, CI, HI, PI, SI, DFI, and ATI, so I system would be calculated, the value would be out. So you would be having two output as explained there. And finally, it should be stated that the underground, underground output of I system itself is a tunneling method, which is called I system's tunneling method and shortened in ITM. It provides you with all of the sequences in design, all of the parameters you require for the optimization, support system you need, excavation technique you need to employ, instrumentation techniques you need to apply for monitoring, prevention technique you need to apply to prevent any failure, forecast technique to see ahead of the faces, and finally design remarks. iSystem software having the same algorithm as explained here for iSystem. However, it has been developed to ease the use of iSystem for geologists, engineers, and designers. It is following the same algorithm, and it is only taking four minutes when you took all of the data from the face to enter to the software, and you get the output. Further to iClass, IGC, and ITM, which are the main outputs of iSystem software, it is also providing you subroutines for the GCD calculated as ground conductivity designation calculator, PL advisor to calculate the pool length required for your specific tunnel face based on the ground properties that you have driven and the class which is classified, PPV predictor, which is the peak particle velocity predictor that 
It is assisting you to uh, calculate it and monitor it. The millimeter, millimeter moving in the tunnel, not to damage further to the structure. SSH identifier, which is a squeezing, swelling, and heaving identifier to find out in the tunnels that you are excavating, is it the squeezing ground, and if it is, in which class, and whatever it is, how to take care of the squeezing ground response. CSP configurator, which is the systematic bolting configurator that assisting you to design the rock bolts, anchors, and so on. And VID assessor, which is the vibration induced damage assessor. Because one of the things that missing in many of the tunnels that I've inspected all over the world is that this part, VID assessor, assessing the damages that we are inducing to the ground even in the mechanized method. It is neglected. When you are considering, you will be saving a lot in time and in cost. Part one is over, and I'm left with about 10 minutes. I would try to uh, brief about the part two. It is starting with this slide, which is the AI, and it is armature index. Armature index itself contains seven parameters. All of these parameters can be derived simply from this table and to put in the equation and calculate the AI, including discontinuity number, discontinuity set, discontinuity inclination, discontinuity aperture, discontinuity disintegration, discontinuity friction, and discontinuity persistence. Second index is the configuration index, CI. It contains two main parameters that uh, assist you to calculate the CI. Both parameters can be derived from this table, including the problematical configuration of ground and a structural configuration of ground. Third parameter is the HI, hydro index. It has two parameters. One is the ground conductivity. You can use the GCD output, ground conductivity designation output, or you just can use the simple wetness diagram. And based on that, pick the parameter, and also ground softness based on MOS. And so, you would be able to calculate the HI. Next parameter is the properties index. It contains several parameters, mainly modeling the soil and soil type ground, including the cohesive consistency, denseness consistency, particle size, particles morphology, body wave velocity, including VP and VS. This index, if you listen to the uh, presentation of uh, Dr. Uh, Rossemi, itself, as a parameter multiplied by five, can be used for TBM to classify the ground ahead of your face when you're driving in alluvium and colloviums and etc. Fifth index is the SI or strength index. It is based on the compressive strengths, scale effect, shape, and the stress conditions of your tunnel and the depth of placement, and easily can be derived from this table and be calculated. After calculating of these five indices, we need to calculate DFI and ETI, which is the impact factors. DFI is the dynamic forces impact. It's a function of peak ground acceleration scale design that usually designers calculating it and using it. Or if you are not a designer, you are an engineer, practical engineer or geologist, you may use ERZ or MSK. And simply from this table, you pick the value for the DFI and put it in the I system equation. Last um, parameter is the excavation technique impact as the final impact factor. It's a function of excavation technique or peak particle velocity. Either you are using um, seismograph at site, you may use the output of the seismograph 
pick the value of ETI. If you are not using, you are employing a method for excavation. Better to say that a technique for excavation. Any of the techniques that you are using with the range of the peak particle velocity which is listed here, you can pick from the table and your ETI is known. So your I value is out. This is the I class, um, which is I systems classification output. This is for the main classes and for underground structures, as you see, the I system classified the ground to 10 classes. And for the ranges, for example, I1 representing 91 to 100, and I10 representing 0 to 10. Recommended support system, recommended excavation technique, recommended instrumentation technique, recommended prevention technique, recommended forecast technique and design remarks for each individual class is with you. So every meter of the tunnel that you are moving or every portion of the slope you are excavating, you, you would be having the information that what you should do, which measures should be installed, what is the dimension, and how to monitor the situation, uh, how to prevent any failure, and how to move ahead. This is the I system output for the surface structures. The same scenario, but in this case for the semi-surface and surface structures. And this is the special cases, special classes as the output of I system, which is representing the recommendations and classifications for burst prone ground time-dependent ground, and viscoelastoplastic grounds. And that was for underground structures, and this is for the surface structures, including the viscoelastoplastic ground. This is the IGC, I-Systems Ground Characterization Output. This is representing the modulus of deformation of ground. This is the unconfined compressive strengths for the ground mass. This is the uniaxial tensile strength of ground mass. This is the Poisson's ratio of ground. And this is the internal friction angle of ground. Actually, this part of the I system also by a PhD students and two master's students in MIT, um, they worked further on this. And for the range of 0 to 40 of I value, they have developed equation which is almost the same. And that is good. And this is the equation of the ground. This is ground conductivity designation. This is a simple equation that simplify the procedure to measure the ground conductivity and solidification quality. I developed this uh, method only to simplify the procedure and to make it more precision and accurate in measuring the damages that we are applying during the excavation, also to measure how much we are improving the quality of ground by pre-injection, pre-grouting, or etc. That is a great help in tunneling specifically. This is a case study using the iSystem software used for the design of the Tunnel T5 uh, in USBR project, which has already completed the project. Uh, there was a pool length configurator, CISB um, calculator, that uh, it is not the subject of this lecture. So, in the uh, maybe in the future, if there was any opportunity for the uh, tunneling method, ITM, that I can explain, I will go further through that uh, details. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Dr. Dr. Haas. Well within the time. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Uh,
and thanks for this comprehensive and insightful talk. I really appreciate that. Uh, now, I request Professor uh, Prashant Wangla to extend our gratitude for the enlightening talk by Dr. Abhinashin Haas by giving a memento as a token of appreciation. This is the last talk of the session. And our third speaker is Professor Trilog Nath Singh, who does not require introduction to the most of the delegates over here. However, for the new and the new audience, I briefly present his biodata and his some of achievements from the several. So Professor T.N. Singh is the esteemed Institute Geoscience Chair Professor at IIT Bombay, ex-Vice Chancellor of Mahatma Gandhi Kashi Vidyapit. And, and currently, he is the director of IIT Patna. He holds PhD in rock mechanics from IIT BHU, Varanasi, and specialized in rock mechanics, slope stability, underground space technology, mining, blasting, and soft computing. His contributions to the field have been recognized with several awards, including the Lifetime Achievement Award by NEEM, and the International Foundation, the Excellence of Teaching Award, the John C. Gammon Prize, and the Professor Gopal Ranjan Rock Mechanics Award. He has impressive record of publications with more than 200 international journals and more than 100 national journal publications, and uh, has edited several books as well. He has was garnered around 16,000 plus citations and has con collaborated internationally with several universities across the world. With this introduction, I request Professor Tikensi to give his talk. So, namaste to all of you. It is indeed great pleasure to standing in front of you, but in any seminar symposia, two situations are very difficult, like many situations you have seen in the tunnel. But in such a scenario, before lunch, one should speak, and one should speak after the lunch. So keep the audience with you is very, very difficult, but People say in Hindi that bhajan or bhojan ke beech mein bevadhan nahi hona chahi. <laughs> but uh, with this uh, things, uh, I am trying to take you half an hour, the time given by Prasant, to the different type of the geological conditions which existing in the ground and how one can cope up with this. And we have this four to five scenario which I wanted to show you what we have done a little bit and that will be the, <coughs> the gist of my talk. As we know that once you have this excavation there is a disturbance in the equilibrium, existing equilibrium and these equilibriums are disturbed at many fold. It might be very less for some ground, it might be very high for the other ground so differential characteristic of each and every rock is different, though they are classified on the similar type. So what I am going to do without going much on the introduction, because all of you are expert in this tunneling technology. So one of this project which I wanted to discuss and how this cavern has been designed, that is the debunk power project or you can say it is a multi-purpose power project which cannot have the only purpose of getting this hydropower generation, but other things like this flood control and other things. So that is the region it will call, and it is in the territory of uh, the Brahmaputra River in Arunachal Pradesh. The estimated capacity is about 2880 megawatt, and it may be the little bit higher on the side, and it will be considered as the one of the biggest hydropower 
uh, facility which will be going to uh, be in India. The project investigates in the construction of 278 plus minus high and 375 meter long concrete gravity dam, which will be also considered as the one of the highest dam, particularly <coughs> in India. Uh, the dam will create a 43 kilometer long reservoir with a gross storage capacity of 3.85 billion cubic meter. And a lot of excavation is going on in this area about the six number of horseshoe shaped headrest tunnel of length varying from 300 meter to 600 meter with the nine meter dia, an underground powerhouse and a six number of horseshoe tail rest tunnel of the length varying from 320 meter to 470 meter with this nine meter diameter. So these are the conditions here. Uh, most of the places, once we decide to go for excavation in the any ground, the first thing one should encounter with the geology of that area. And this area is highly disturbed area. And the rocks are very, very weak, you can say. Uh, the rock properties which has been determined by the different agencies are also not agreeable and adjustable. The in-situ stress measurement has been taken by two pointer Institute of India. That is also not this agreeable. They are not in the agreement that they both are coming on the some places where the convergence that these properties can be taken into account. So that was the difficulty in this kind of the condition. And mostly the quadratic rocks are very, very fragile in nature here. Normally quadratic is considered to be the hard rock. But in this place, we have the number of discontinuity and fractures that leads to a, some kind of this weakening uh, within this rock. Uh, you can see uh, here, uh, this is the just like a location and this is the place where <coughs> uh, this project has been under the process. And uh, this will be the location of these major caverns, powerhouse and transformer house. So just you can see this place, we have the place itself. So some of the site information which I already I told you, but these two main caverns whose dimensions is already given. <coughs> and just you can see the, how much excavation is required, 427 meter length, 23.5 meter width, and 54.3 meter of the high. And that will be the, a huge volume of the rock we are going to excavate. The third cavern is also the dimension is given here, and you can see uh, <coughs> what will be the condition once you are going to exhibit a, such a huge amount of this rock from the inside of this earth system. And this most of the, all the three years are aligned with this <coughs> direction. So this is the engineer geological uh, information uh, which I have gathered from the different sources. The project region, the dam site is located about 1.5 kilometer upstream of the confluence of uh, the Asupari and the Diwang River. Uh, this is the just uh, a river which is uh, uh, bringing lot of water, and these waters are going to be devastating, devastating in. Uh, <coughs> devastating in nature. The in-situ stress measurement I have already told to you. The in-situ ratio, uh, stress ratio, mostly varying from taking the average of all these is 1.25 to 1.42. And magnitude of the horizontal <coughs> major principal stress, vertical principal stress, and horizontal minor principal stress were 13.22 megapascal, 10.58 megapascal, and 8.81 megapascal respectively. Uh, this is the, our layout of these caverns, which has been modeled. Just you can see all these things all be listed here with the color code. And we have used uh, this structure, will be simulation. 
just you can see here the three deck uh, we have used it and these are the a different kind of this characteristic and here you can see this geological section uh, cutting across the six of this pH carbon in the 3D model. These are the things. And this is the behavior. Just you can see the stage of excavation in this figure. And these are the zone-wise distributed rock properties used in the numerical analysis zone 1, 2, 3 to 9, and you are a little bit somewhere these uh, values are low and high, but somewhere it is consistent, like well, the density almost they are similar, but you have this sigma c, you can see it will be almost similar, but once you can see the k and g, that will be the variable, and this accordingly these are the properties. So this are the displacement of uh, this uh, cavern wall the upstream and the downstream side. And these are the maximum displacement at various or different points around this cavern in a elastic, perfectly plastic model. And just you can see how it is varying. So the displacement and distance curve were maintained. These are the displacement in this powerhouse that has been observed. And this maximum displacement of different points around the powerhouse cavern in elastic perfectly model, you can see this linear rock bolts and the tendon support. This is the distance and this is the displacement. The very, very high displacement has been recorded in some of the places. Uh, once you can have the transformer hall, you can see this, this is the situation. And these are, again, the maximum displacement has been recorded. And here also is a similar situation with the distance, and you have the displacement. These are the things which are going on. So uh, this was the first information I wanted to give. Then again, to stress and deformation behavior of weak jointed rock mass during the tunneling. Just you can see this is one of the tunnel in Himachal Pradesh. You can see this is the main tunnel and this is the escape tunnel. And these are the properties which we have determined and calculated the values of the Q and this RMR. And these are the data from the escape panel. And we have tried to model this one to get this deformational properties. And here the rocks are mostly the phyletic rocks, which are very fragile or weak in nature. They have the directional properties also. And this is the, some of the field photographs. Thus, you can see the conditions of the rock type. And this is the section. This is the main tunnel. This is the escape tunnel, 8.5 meter dia, 12 meter dia. And here, this is the surface ground. This is a 26 meter cover. This is a, just like a transport tunnel for this communication system, road tunnel, so I can say. And here this is the escape tunnel, the 36 meter high. Here, this is the clay, mostly the lo loose overburden material. And here, these are the, you can say the sandstone, but very immature sandstone. Though the quartz percentage is very, very high, but Due to the presence of this mica and the clay material, this strength is very, very low. So normally our understanding is the once this sandstone higher the quad percentage, strength will be higher. But that will be not be uh, available in this rock type. And for that we have done a lot of uh, back analysis about this XRD and other things. And we are trying to find out what is the reason why it is not following the general behavior which we have observed. 
just you can see this is the model which I have <coughs> we have model it the same thing and here you have this three scenario a displacement in the tunnel at the crown level the middle level and this invert level and once you have <coughs> got it this is you see supported and unsupported time of the displacement horizontal distance and you can see here these places and here you can see in this inward level the maximum displacement just you can see <coughs> again we are trying to find out the displacement here in all escape and mental end <coughs> and these are the ground disturbance due to the tunnelling which has been plotted. Uh, after this, I am just trying to find out uh, some of the things which are we have done in this small scale uh, physical model in the laboratory just to simulate a certain conditions uh, from the side. As you know, the uh, physical models are very, very important to make it understand those who are not even aware about the tunneling. And these physical models have been used from the very beginning, but these models are also giving a certain information, inherent physical information about the ground condition. And that we are trying to solve here. Uh, before doing the physical model, I am not going to, de going to detail how we have made uh, the certain parameters which are affecting how to neutralize the dimensional effect or make it a dimensional sequence. So these, all the things has been done uh, prior to scaling down the physical properties. What we have done, this is the field properties. By this laboratory properties become all the constants K. And that has been taken into and to avoid any kind of the dimensional uh, <coughs> effect. Just you can see, this is the small model which we wanted to create in this wooden blocks is inserted in the model just to make it the, uh, to see the behavior once we have the excavation. And these are the certain uh, standard which I told you that uh, we wanted to make a constant of these parameters at uh, these are the strength, bulk density and geometry. Mostly it is a soil type of behavior and just you can see what we have done. We have tested the rock uh, before going to this making the model. Once you are making the model, uh, all the analysis of the soil parameters has been done. And these are given in this table. Some XRD analysis to know something inside about the soil. And just you can see this how this model is behaving here. And these are the, some of the photographs from the laboratory where you can see the disturbance in the tunnel or in the excavation, I can say small scale excavation. And the grid has been made to measure this displacement and the reformation under the <coughs> different stage of the excavation and that has been later on <coughs> seen and these are the you can see this diagram where we wanted to show how this is the sagging or even the convergence or maybe you can call it is a subsidence and this is the condition so we have plotted this here this all these conditions and you can see this average subsidence with respect to the <coughs> excavation. And here we have the complete collapse zone. In silo tunnel, uh, this kind of the condition, so these are the cases <coughs> and the diagram which we wanted to show what we have done. At, you have to see, this is the wooden blocks have been inserted so that slowly we can remove and see the conditions how this ground will be behaving in such a scenario. 
at a different stages, what kind of this phase displacement we have recorded will be gives us given here. The maximum 11 centimeter phase displacement has been recorded. And the same has been plotted in this tunnel phase displacement <coughs> with the influence of the distance in the various conditions in this place. And these are the electrical tunnel deformation. And the same has been plotted here, the lateral state and all. <laughs> uh, same thing, uh, we have tried to model it by the numerical analysis, 2D numerical analysis using the Plexi software. And <coughs> we have tried to find out. And some of the results uh, I wanted to just show you, just you can see these results and the plots. Uh, what we are trying to uh, <coughs> con uh, convey to here that uh, the physical model, if you can make it very carefully and taking all the parameter into the consideration and once you can do the numerical analysis, they have a certain type of this agreement between both. Both are uh, giving a certain kind of the information <coughs> which are similar, but uh, deformational behavior, physically you can see only in the physical model rather than in numerical model, you can find out the trend, how it is going to happen. Uh, <coughs> this is this, uh, the plot of the total displacement of the longitudinal profile along the tunnel axis, just you can see here at the different locations. So, uh, I have just summarized, I'm not going to read, so don't worry <coughs> about it. Uh, we have done this uh, two type of this analysis, the full circle and the asymmetrical circle. And this uh, m minimum at CD will be 0.5 and the CD uh, conditions and the maximum at the CD of the 1.5, that, that will be the full circle we, information we got. Uh, about the asymmetric cycle, also uh, we have the maximum deformation of the soil overburden mainly occurred around the vicinity of the tunnel phase. And there is uh, a significant difference between the shear bands developed in both the longitudinal and lateral directions. So these are the, some of this information which we extracted out of this our experiment and rest of this all already I have given. Uh, just the effect of this duster uh, jointed rock mass under the variable condition, you can see. Uh, this also we have tried to model it. And this rock parameters are given here. And just you can get this deformational parameters. And here you can see deformation and the normal stress. And these are all the plots has been given. Uh, deformation mode, uh, <coughs> modes of this rock massage, which we have observed in the different places. This is the classical uh, example from this book. And you can see here this normal shear and the normal and shear, what will the shape, the hypothesis and the lateral expansion. And <coughs> uh, this is the things which you have taken from this uh, Barton Bandis a joint slip criteria parameter, which has been used for the simulation. And these are the things that we taken from their paper. And our material will be falling in this profile proposed by this Barton and Chaube in 1977. This is the things. And this is the, you can see this model once you are having a different type of the joints in this rock mass. And then you have the distribution about the stressage. This is the total displacement curve. This will be the displacement here, you can see. The maximum displacement, what we are getting. Uh, once you have <coughs> this, this is the conditions which will be probably at this point, there is a displacement of this rock mass. And here also you can see there is a disturbance in the periphery once you are doing the total displacement. Uh, this is the another scenario where this 75 degree jointing, 
then you have a 90 degree vertical joints are here simulated. This is the condition. And once you have the jointing, just you can see the similar other parameters and this joint having their effect and how the disturb this ground mass will be at this ground level. So that we wanted to show that once you have a, all the parameters similar, but you have a geological discontinuity of this varying angle, the deformational behavior will be different. So the rock property is important, but the, by the same time, jointed rock property is extremely important to incorporate in any kind of this modeling. So this is the information <coughs> which we extracted out of that. And these are the interpretation of uh, all this what the model, uh, we have done it. Uh, then th the last example I have done, uh, the one of the PhD student has done, just we have collected this uh, sandstone uh, sample from this Jodhpur site, one of the tunnel area, and we have tried to develop a jointing parameter which we have modeled in the laboratory. So we have cut this rock in the different sizes with the specification of different type of the joint which has been incorporated in the rock mass, and then we have tried to test it in this UTM machine. Here you can see this machine on which this block has been placed, and these are the properties uh, which we have determined uh, for this rock type. And once you can see this opening, uh, what kinds of, and by the same time you have put this AI sensors also to know this energy level and the count of this energy events and how this energy is distributed once you are loading uh, <coughs> this rock block which has been a certain kind of this opening. And you can see here this is the fracture, there is horizontal sets of the joints, here this, there is a no joints but still here there is some disturbance. And this is the vertical joints, this And you can see this acoustic emission has been given us as some information about where this energy is accumulated at this higher rate, and that will be giving some indication that this rock is under the disturbed condition, and it is about to fail. So AI <laughs> will provide a very good, uh, you can say, this information uh, about the failure of this rock, and that will be also can be used as an alarming situation once this is accumulated uh, energy will be increasing, kinetic energy mostly increasing, then there is a chance of failure or spalling. It may be the failure will be the larger or maybe the failure will be in the lesser amount, it depending upon the characteristic of the mineral. And here, <coughs> the most of the places we are getting a certain kind of the fractures because it is a hard rock, they are very brittle behavior. So uh, instantaneously we are getting a, some kind of the cracking noise and that will be the matching uh, with our acoustic emission. Uh, uh, just you can see this other graphs about this. This is the energy accumulation. And these are the other information we can get about the strain and this vertical load here and here, you can see. So, <laughs> we have tried to find out uh, the seismic activities uh, within that one also, and just, we have incorporated uh, just like a, <laughs> you can say this earthquake magnitude, this higher side, and that can be included in this model also to know that once you will be the seismic activities in the particular area, what will be happen to this rock mass. And just you, you have just taken this example from the Sioux et al. 2017, and this Cheng et al. in the <coughs> reference of 2013. And these are this, you can see this intact rock blocks with horizontal joint set, with the vertical joint set, and these are the disturbed area in the periphery of this opening. And what we have got in our model will be this agreement of what they have indicated and the disturbance in this zone and this zone. So uh, this will be the curve with this uh, 
cumulative count versus the time. And just you can see this red line. It is the horizontal sets of the joints. This black one will be the intact one, having this linearly increasing at this energy level. And this will be the vertical joint set. So all along the joints, it is going to be like this. And <coughs> these are the, you can see this other curve. Uh, the same thing has been modeled. And we are trying to give you the positions of this lateral sections in the meter and the signals. And just you can see the intact rock will be giving this higher kind of the signal as compared to the jointed rock mass because there is no energy dissipation on that one. There is no release of energy. All the energy is accumulated and busted and that will be the condition in this deeper coal mines or deeper mines of the metal mines, the rock bust is happening and that will be the <coughs> scenario here. So uh, these are the interpretation. Uh, in case of this intact rock, the crack generated during the loading was the continuous and the, the particle injection phenomena appeared within the hole and then developed into the four forceful injection of sand particle uh, from the side wall. So <coughs> here in this uh, vertical joint condition, vertical slices above the tunnel crown is moved into the tunnel which is <coughs> solely supported by its own joint shear strength and hence the axial strength on this block is measured very less. So these are the uh, findings uh, about the horizontal joints, intact trough and the vertical joints. Uh, uh, <coughs> and these are the all observation uh, we are getting from this AE match with the numerical analysis and the laboratory investigation. So uh, many a times uh, a small experiment, a scaled down parameter can also give you a very nice insight about this phenomena which is happening in the larger scale in this actual condition or in situ conditions. So uh, nevertheless, uh, we should not think that this only we can incorporate all these parameters, all these conditions in a one goal and then get this information. May that, uh, that type of condition will be sometimes more confusing and will not give a better and clear cut interference out of this experiment. So that will be the things which I wanted to <coughs> just convey and these are the, some of this uh, where we have the support system, and just you can see, uh, this is the last, don't worry, Prasant. <coughs> so, just you can see here. And these are the three conditions of the joint. We have the cross joint, already and cross section joints. And these has been simulated, and just you can see, the over break zone represents the zone beyond the maximum exhibition line of the design periphery from where the rock block slabs detach completely from the rock mass. The damage zone <coughs> start uh, from this upper periphery of this over break zone. And the disturbed zone is extending immediately from the damage zone boundary. In this zone, the change in the rock mass properties are reversible, only the hydraulic probability, uh, permeability, and the stress change dominate here. So these are the things which we wanted to show you. And these are the certain curves of the ground settlement curve you can see in the central part of this <coughs> section. And these are the properties of this material. And just you can see uh, some of this our modeling. What we have narrated, this will be the things here, disturbance. And <coughs> once you can insert it, a certain kind of the support measure to minimize the damage. So these are the three meter bolts. This is the five meter bolt. This is the seven meter bolts. So how one can optimize the, what will be the size of the bolt is required to arrest the deformation within the rock mass. That will be also crucial because sometimes, we, of course, we are getting information from the different kind of the rock classification. So what should the appropriate size? But sometimes they have the given the range four to six meter, five to seven meter like that. And then you have the confusion 
that whether I should go with the 5 or whether you should go by the 7. So which will be the appropriate? But these models will give you the, uh, what will be the exactly uh, the length which can able to arrest the failure at this crown level. And these are these, you can say, uh, the plot with this tunnel boundary and the displacement. Here, here you can see the disturbance. And these are these other plots of this jointing, V type of joint, C types of joint. So all three models, and these are this, you can see this bold parameter is the total displacement. So uh, I will just skip this one because, uh, but only I wanted to say that uh, monitoring is a crucial phenomena, and one should not avoid it, and one should not understand that it will be the ornamental only. Because many a places we don't have this information about the instrumented data. And this data is very, very crucial because the data is full of information. It has embedded information. One has to extract that information and then try to move ahead for the, to arrest the, any kind of uh, this unwanted uh, forces which is happening in the various uh, tunnels or in the mines or underground mines. So that will be there. And uh, these are this, the different kind of the sensors. And now yesterday, uh, Dr. Goel has said about the instrumentation in detail. And he has touched upon the fiber uh, level of uh, using the fiber optics as a, one of the sensors with the multiple sensors. And these sensors are providing a very good information uh, about this. Uh, of course, it is a little bit costly, but it will be giving you the holistic information uh, about the cavity and all these things. So these are the type of sensor, the distribution sensor. And uh, what is the physics behind it? That will be the mentioned here. So I'm not going uh, because of the paucity of the time, uh, but you can see uh, their effect. So these are the things which I wanted to say to you and about uh, the censoring. And there are, of course, there are many type of, you can say, the sensors which are available. So with these words, uh, once again, I'm thankful uh, to the organizer for giving him this opportunity. Of course, the time is given is very, very short to explain each and everything in the greater detail. And that might leave some of these questions in your mind. Thank you very much. Processing, thanks a lot for a comprehensive presentation, which includes numerical simulations, model tests, as well as optical fiber sensing. In fact, one of our colleagues is also working on optical fibers. I think he might be disappointed because you have completed in short time. It's fine. We can discuss that. Maybe he will be in greater detail. <laughs> yeah, sure. He can discuss. So uh, with this, I thank our third speaker for this lecture, and I request... Uh, uh, student yes. volunteer to yes sir so now i would like to request professor uh, Pr prashant wangla to extend our gratitude for this profound talk by professor t n singh by giving a memento as a token of appreciation now i would like to invite professor manna on stage to extend our gratitude towards Professor Prashant Wangla for his efforts in the coordination and management of this session by presenting a token of appreciation. Thank you. That's all for forenoon session. I think now we head to dinner, no, sorry, lunch. Uh, so the venue is same. Uh, yeah, venue is at Central Square only, and uh, we'll resume at two thirty. Thank you.